do you want to, um, do you want to, have you got a recorder? Or? Oh, well, I have right? my phone. I could, um, I don't know if I know how to turn this thing on. Okay. Thank you for being here. I'd like to uh, open the study session for the City Council for the City of Wheat Ridge, Colorado for September 17, 2018. We will um, start our meeting with citizen comment on any agenda items. And I have a sign-up sheet here, and we'll go down the list. Uh, Robert Robinson, first up, and Jan Rose on deck. And if when you come to, if you would uh, come up to speak. Come to the podium, give us your uh, first name and last name, if you would spell your last name for us so we get it on the record, and give us an address. Good evening, my name's uh, Rob Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. I live at Four Hillside Drive. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to talk about the budget. should point out first that uh, <clears throat> I'm a member of the Wheat Ridge Environmental Sustainability Committee, but I'm here today that, to really represent myself, uh, uh, the things I have to say uh, have not been uh, uh, discussed with the rest of the committee. I'm not representing the committee. Now, I did uh, take a look at the budget uh, and also the summary that's in the agenda for this evening. And I was quite uh, disappointed. Uh, there's uh, nothing in the budget that reflects the work that the committee did. Yes, there are some environmental things. There's continuation of the volunteer tree plantings, uh, uh, an energy audit of the rec center, uh, continuation of the open space program. All those things are environmental in nature. But in this budget, the city has not upped its game towards environmental sustainability. Uh, or, as the Ridge 2035 vision calls it, environmental stewardship. And I'm particularly disappointed because we have spent the last year, uh, the committee has, uh, a meeting twice a week. We've had presentations from several of the uh, 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 directors of the department heads here, whom we are very impressed with. Uh, they're all very, all very uh, savvy on environmental issues. Uh, in some ways, you probably didn't need the committee. Could have asked them, <laughs> because many of the suggestions that we incorporated in our, in our uh, uh, recommendations uh, came from the city staff. And yet, we had all those meetings. We had a representative from the city uh, sitting in on all our meetings, presumably the communication between ourselves and the city. We gave the city council three presentations. The last one was in June. And yet none of this has bubbled up in this budget. I would urge you, now that you've got this proposed budget, to strongly consider other things that we suggested. After all, I don't have, to, I'm just repeating something you all uh, know. Um, perhaps we're facing significant environmental risks, floods, fire, and drought. Floods and drought at the same time. And I recommend that you at least 
perhaps think of it as uh, 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 the investment on the part of the city like an insurance policy. We all have, most of us I guess, have insurance on our car, insurance on our house. None of us really expect our house to burn down or to have a car wreck, but we have that insurance anyway. And whether you believe in some of these issues or not, it's a small price to pay to uh, uh, invest in some environmental sustainability. But, and there's a payoff, some significant improvements in the cost of the city for some, some of the services, for the livability of the city, and so on. So as you deliberate the budget in the next few weeks, strongly urge you to take some of the recommendations, more than just a trivial uh, measure towards accepting some of the recommendations of the committee and, uh, uh, and some of the ideas of the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jan Rose and Rachel Holteen on deck. Hi, my name is Jan Rose, uh, like the flower. Uh, I live at 10221 West 38th Ave, across from Morningstar. Um, I canceled an appointment that I was going to uh, meet today with the city of Golden that's been on my calendar for quite some time, but the budget got released and I looked at Wheat Ridges and compared to Golden, and I felt compelled to cancel that one and come here. Um, how many people know what Golden is celebrating today? No. Um, today is the 10th year of their sustainability goals in the city of Golden. Um, here's what they're offering their constituency. Let's talk trash and find out what new items can be thrown in your single stream recycling bin. Let's find out the biggest water conservation that you can implement. Hint, it's not inside. See the alternative transportation options available. Now is the time to have a say in the future of Golden's resiliency and climate adaptation. So you got Golden, you got Lakewood, you got Arvada, you got Denver. You are literally surrounded by cities who have taken major steps towards sustainability and resilience goals. They benefit us, your citizens, your constituents. They benefit you, they benefit your children. Denver has a plan for any commercial building over 20,000 square feet has to have a green roof or solar panels. A year ago, you had a billion dollar storm damage from the hailstorm. I have solar panels on my roof. I didn't get a new roof. Solar panels are engineered to withstand the softball size hail. Of the 3,000 panels on the roof of NREL, one cracked in last year's hailstorm. One out of 3,000. You watched what happened with Colorado Mills last year and how they closed down for almost nine months, cost the city a tremendous amount of sales tax revenue. If you had mandated in the city code that the Clear Creek Crossing development have solar panels on their roof, not only would they be a net positive for the city, they wouldn't shut down for our annual hailstorm and cost us millions of dollars in tax revenue. So I would like you to really seriously consider that with all of these new condos and rental units going in by Ward Road, the G line, and going in on Colfax where the W line is, et cetera, if you mandate charging stations so that you can uh, encourage renters to invest in electric cars, if you can pick a single trash company, I live at 38th and Lee, I watch eight different companies roll by my house between Wednesday and Friday, tearing up the roads, spewing a bunch of diesel. It's nuts. I belong to both Applewood neighborhood and Wheat Ridge neighbors, and I watch the constant stream of, I hate my trash company, who's a good trash company? We, we could save a lot of money and a lot of pollution if we just pick a trash company. We could create a community garden if we start a methane, a composting facility for our city. We could open up the fields right next to the Wheat Ridge Rec Center behind my house, put in a community solar garden for all those apartments over there on 44th. Do you know that because of my solar panels, XL Energy pays me at the end of every year? Thank you. 
I, I would really like to suggest that you reconsider some of the money. Not only can you pass it on in zoning fees and permit charges, but you can set a standard that matches the cities that are all the way around you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Rachel Holteen with uh, Joe DeMott on deck. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Rachel Holteen, and I live at 4690 Balsam Street. And I'm here this evening to um, give some uh, input on the budget. Uh, I read all 254 pages of it. No, I didn't. <laughs> Um, but I did take a really good look at it, and I think there's a lot in the budget to be excited about in the year ahead. And I'm excited about the priorities that Council has set forth that um, you guys have decided are important to you. And I think that they are, for the most part, aligning with you know where we are as a city today and the direction we want to go. Um, one of the initiatives that I've been really involved in is Activate 38. It's a three-year grant through Kaiser Permanente to local works to improve walking, biking, and rolling on 38th Avenue. We have a lot of 38th Avenue in the city, and this is 38th Avenue west of Kipling. Um, that particular stretch of 38th Avenue is really hostile for people who are walking and riding bikes and connecting with transit. In that corridor, due to transportation um, limitations, there are no alternatives. There's no north connector to 44th Avenue, so you're forced to travel on 38th. Um, there are limited southern connectors to 32nd, and there's really no east-west alternative. This forces a lot of that community who depends on walking and biking and wheelchair rolling to connect with transit, community services, recreation, um, and just have social life. I've talked to a lot of teenagers that, uh, you know, they like to get around the community and their families won't let them walk or ride their bikes on 30th Avenue because it's too dangerous. The grant is looking at longer term solutions and we recognize the corridor has significant challenges including drainage. Um, but what we'd really like to do is work with the city in 2019 to um, address a couple of spot um, priorities that have actually been identified by the corridor, people who live on the corridor and work on the corridor. And those include putting in some speed checker signs to help slow down cars. Slowing down cars was the number one priority identified by the community last year. The second recommendation by the community was to refresh the existing crosswalks to raise awareness of where pedestrians might be safely crossing. And then another priority that the community has set forth <coughs> excuse me, is um, highlighting alternative routes that do exist, such as 35th Avenue from Parfit East, um, as well as 38th Place. So doing some um, signage to help encourage people to take those safer alternative routes. So um, while there's no specific funds earmarked in the budget, we hope to work with the city either through the budgeting process or moving forward into 2019 to um, make sure that some of these quick wins that address sa safety conditions today happen so that the community feels that it's a safer place to walk, ride, and roll. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Joe Dumont. Hi all, I'm Joe DeMott, D-E capital M-O-T-T. -T. I'm here to uh, talk to you about the Carnation Festival and the Wheat Ridge Business District, uh, two things on your budget. Um, I was made aware that I, um, it was too late to submit in writing any increases that we were requesting, um, so I thought I'd come ask you right now. Um, our Carnation Festival, this will be our 50th year as we celebrate the 50th year of the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, and I know you have several things on the budget that uh, we have to celebrate that. Um, but um, along with our 50th celebration, we also have um, improvements at Anderson Park this year. Um, there'll be twice as much of everything, we hope. Uh, it should align really well with the Carnation Festival and we're very excited. We have a lot of actually new board members this year who are coming to plan with us and um, had great, great response from the community, um, great help from the police department, the parks department, public works. Um, I absolutely cannot say enough about what they do for us um, and I hope we don't make it too long a weekend for them. I know some of them are there in the middle of the night with us and we appreciate it. So. Um, 
you're always generous to give us eighty thousand dollars the last couple of years and uh, we were hoping for an increase for this year uh, there will be two stages this year will be a gazebo stage we'll still keep the main stage up front um, we have uh, each year our our donations are our reimbursement for work is what it is. We can call it a donation, but it's all the hard work of the Optimus, the Rotary, the Kiwanis, the kids from the high school, the football players, the cheerleaders, and the Palms. Um, we have uh, 17 different uh, service organizations and organizations that benefit from the Carnation Festival. Um, we want to make sure that they continue to uh, get reimbursed for their hard work as well as um, make this year even better. Uh, to celebrate, you know, we have a free, free show, some free uh, event, some things people pay for, but we want to keep those um, costs down. I've got a budget here, a, a profit and loss, not a budget, uh, but uh, I printed exactly enough for everybody, so somebody's going to have to share if I have to keep one to answer questions, but I'll be here to answer, and uh, <coughs> um, our Weird Business District there is a line item in your budget now under local works for the Wheat Ridge Business District. I believe they're asking for an additional 30000 That came from our... Uh, do I have 30 seconds? Um, we have... Uh, oh. Uh, our Facade Plus program was a big success. Raphael's Hair Studio and Post Oak Hall finished projects. Um, they each received twenty thousand dollars, and they each ended up spending over a hundred and twenty-six, I think, a piece. One hundred and twenty-six was the lowest they spent. Um, I can answer questions. I could even forward you some pictures on that if you'd like. And I'm here to answer questions. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Um, that's all the people that I have signed up to speak uh, tonight from the public. Is there anyone here who hasn't signed up who would like to speak? You may do so at this time. Okay, I don't see anyone, so we will move to our first um, order of business, the Edward Byrne Justice Assistance Grant. Chief Brennan is here to give a Chief. quick explanation. Do you want to pull the mic over? Sorry. There we go. Thank you, Mayor and Patrick. Uh, just a... a a quick overview, uh, annually the police department uh, receives a justice assistance grant through the Bureau of Justice Administration. Uh, this grant, if, uh, if you review the staff report, can be used actually in about uh, 24 topical areas. I've condensed those into uh, 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 some of the, uh, the major sections uh, that, uh, that are contained within the guidelines for the grant. Uh, this year we received a grant in the amount of $10,095. That grant amount is determined by a funding formula that uh, BGA uses that looks at uh, population and part one crime. So that's how they come up with that figure. Uh, bigger jurisdictions that have more violent crime tend to get uh, tend to get more dollars and we've consistently been in that ten to twelve thousand dollar range that we receive annually we've used that money specifically for either law enforcement programs so community policing crime prevention initiatives and uh, we've also uh, used it to uh, procure equipment and technology that we've needed uh, last year we uh, uh, decided that uh, uh, with with uh, uh, you know your input to use the ten thousand one hundred and seventy eight dollars that we received to purchase a uh, mobile automatic uh, automated license plate reader uh, we were going to use uh, funding out of our uh, police uh, uh, seizure fund fund 17 to purchase a trailer that we could move around to hot spots in the community and put that trailer up and uh, utilize it to try to find stolen stolen vehicles, uh, people who are wanted, uh, those kinds of things. Unfortunately, uh, because of grant conditions that were put in uh, that particular grant, uh, there was a injunction filed by, uh, a request for an injunction filed by several uh, larger cities uh, uh, based on uh, special conditions that were in that award that uh, were specific to the current administration that we have. Uh, 
those, uh, that put a freeze on all those grant dollars and uh, those conditions were uh, subsequently removed and here within the last month that $10,178 was, was uh, released and our time period to spend that money was, was increased. The thing that has changed that, uh, that we wanted to look at uh, uh, this year was the, the types of personal protection equipment that, uh, that we uh, issue our officers. Uh, for instance, every officer has uh, what we call soft body armor that, uh, that they wear that's rated at uh, generally a level two or two A, so it'll stop uh, you know, most handgun rounds. But in light of what we've seen both nationally and locally uh, with uh, fatal encounters involving uh, uh, you know, uh, heavily armored uh, and armed suspects, we had three police shootings, fatal police shootings uh, uh, that started in uh, uh, New Year's Eve in 2017 through the month of February, we lost three deputies. Uh, we had a Colorado Springs officer who was in a, uh, a deadly encounter uh, uh, three weeks ago uh, who was uh, shot and critically wounded, uh, now is in a recovery mode. Colorado, unfortunately, also has, uh, you know, the history of uh, not only uh, uh, high school shootings, fatal high school shootings, but a theater shooting. And in Colorado Springs, just a couple years ago, at the Planned Parenthood location, you, we had a heavily armed suspect that uh, got inside a building and uh, wounded and killed uh, many people. So. I asked the question after the first of the year, after uh, we saw the first uh, uh, fatal uh, law enforcement officer deaths, what kind of protective equipment do our officers have? How are they, they equipped if we were ever to have a call for service that, uh, that involved uh, you know, a heavily armed suspect or suspects? What would we have? We certainly know our SWAT team is, is equipped with ballistic helmets and ballistic shields, and they have the, uh, you know, the heavier tactical vests. Uh, you know, that uh, will help stop rifle rounds, but what do our officers, our real true first responders have? And the answer uh, was that the last time this organization spent any money on uh, police protective equipment beyond the soft body armor that we issue was in the early 2000s. Uh, most of that equipment is, is old, it's no longer functional, and has been, uh, 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 just because of wear and tear sitting in the back of the vehicles is, is not even uh, uh, available to officers. So we did a project to, uh, a research project to look at what it would cost to uh, purchase equipment for uh, 50 officers. So we currently have 59 uh, officers and supervisors assigned to the patrol function. Uh, seven of those officers are already assigned to the SWAT team. Uh, so they have uh, the uh, uh, ballistic helmets, the the uh, heavier level four uh, ballistic plates and the uh, tactical carriers to, uh, you know, so that they can carry that kind of equipment. We uh, figured it was gonna cost about $890, I think is the figure per officer to equip them with uh, uh, ballistic helmets, uh, the uh, tactical vests, and the uh, plate carriers uh, that would go inside the vests. And uh, when you do the math on that, it comes out to around $42,000 to equip all those officers. So from a Bureau of Justice Administration perspective, there are a couple of things that, uh, that we, you know, I need uh, your consensus to move forward on. Well, the first is to reappropriate the $10,178 uh, from last year's grant to, uh, to this purpose. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, your consensus to use the $10,075 for that purpose. And that'll give us right about $21,000. Uh, I also have about uh, $60,000 in our police asset forfeiture uh, fund 17 account. And we would use the remainder of, uh, we'd, we'd, we would use that to pay for the remainder of the balance to equip all of our patrol officers uh, with, uh, with personal protective equipment above and beyond the soft body armor that they carry. BGA requires that, uh, that you know, we notify our council, our elected officials, of the purpose of the grant, and they also require us to notify the public of what we wish to uh, spend that money on. So we have done a media release uh, we have on our city website. We've posted on our Facebook page uh, this uh, study session tonight for anybody who wishes to provide input uh, to us. And uh, the other requirement is just consensus from our elected officials to move forward in this direction. 
will repurpose the money from 2017 and then use the money from 2018 to start the process, the bidding process, uh, purchase bid process to purchase this equipment. I'd have, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Do we have uh, questions of counsel for um, Chief Brennan? Mr. Matthews. Just, this hasn't shown up in our budget. You know, I think you said things just changed, but would that be, I'm looking at page 276, it's the police budget, and under that item, under <clears throat> line item 730, uniforms and protective clothing, is that where you'd be no, putting that? No, it would be under grants, it would be under 202. These are grant funds, that, that is our regular uh, budget for uh, uniforms and soft body armor. Okay, let me, let me see if I can fi find that. Additional questions? <clears throat> Ms. Hoppy. So, Chief, but what you're saying to us is that through Fund 17 and then this grant, those monies combined is enough money to um, cover the cost for the new PPE for the... Um, officers? Yes, it would all be grant funding and police seizure money that would uh, would be utilized. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Ms. Hoppy. Um, I don't see anybody else's hands going up, so I would just like to try to make a consensus to move forward for the, um, to approve the use of the JAG funds to uh, purchase the police protective equipment. Do we have consensus there? Chief, there's your answer. Thank you. Looks like a unanimous uh, vote. Thank you for this presentation. We will move on to item number two, which is a presentation of the 2019 budget. Mr. Goff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you have in front of you uh, a handout of the presentation, so you can follow that, or we'll have it up on the screen also. So um, if you have any questions during the presentation that will help you maybe clarify something, please, please ask that so um, you can understand what's, what's being said. But if you could leave most of your policy-related questions to the end, I think that might be more efficient, if that's okay with everybody. <clears throat> and then we also have um, our department um, directors here to uh, help answer questions, too, when you're ready. <laughs> so... 2019 proposed budget, 50 years strong, as, as Mr. DeMott mentioned, we're celebrating 50 years here next year, so um, proud accomplishment of this community. Next slide, please. I um, always like to show this, this, um, this slide um, quickly. Uh, the city received this again in 2018 for the 2018 year um, budget. Um, the city receives this award because our budget document reflects both the guidelines established by the Na National Advisory Council on state and local budgeting, but also the Government Finance Officers Association best practices on budgeting. So you can thank Heather Geyer um, and staff for that, um, making sure that we get that every year. Uh, and then the Wheat Ridge Vision 2035, um, I know you all know this by heart, um, but I always like to uh, read this every budget cycle, um, just because this is, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and this was put together by you and previous councils. It's usually tweaked every council, but this is our current vision. Wheat Ridge is an attractive um, and inviting city and community for families. Wheat Ridge has great neighborhoods, is a hub of commerce with a choice of economically viable commercial areas, and has a diverse transportation. Wheat Ridge is committed to environmental stewardship, and its residents enjoy an active, healthy lifestyle and are proud of their hometown. Wheat Ridge, a great place to live, work, and play. So diving right into the budget, um, just to give you this quick overview, I showed this slide last year too, but um, there's really four main um, um, categories of funds um, that we have in our budget. And the biggest one is, is our general fund operating budget. That um, is our, our daily budget where we make most, most of our expenses um, come out of that budget. And then, then we have um, eight special funds, and we'll go through all these in more detail later, but eight special funds is a public art fund, police investigation fund, open space, municipal court, conservation trust, equipment replacement, crime prevention, and recreation center fund. Um, some of those are set up by, by law. They have to be, um, revenues and expenses have to be tracked in separate funds, and some are, are just done for more budget convenience. Um, the third category is our capital improvement program budget, um, and that's where most of our large capital 
um, infrastructure, street projects, drainage projects, and such are, are put in, into that, that budget or that fund. And then what's new for the last couple of years is our bond fund, um, the 2E fund, we call it, um, investing for the future fund, you may, you may hear us call it too also, and that, that um, tracks the revenues and expenses from the 2E um, sales tax increase. Uh, the next slide, there's, there's a lot of numbers on here, but um, we'll go into all these in more detail. But um, I just, I kind of wanted to show this because th this shows um, kind of the breakdown of the total budget and then what portion of the 2E fund that, uh, budget that is, because it's a large portion of it. If you look at the column on the, on the clear right and several rows down, the pro proposed expenditures for all funds um, next year is just over 75 million. Um, if you go a little bit left on that, in that same row, um, all other funds, um, all f other funds minus the 2E fund is 53 million of that. The 2E fund alone is is um, just over 22 million. So, um, although we have a, a large budget of 75 million, 53 million is primarily um, the general operations, um, and 22 is that 2E bond fund. And th this is just a graphical representation of that same chart um, that shows you um, how those expenditures are broken down. So again, our general um, operating budget, again, is the largest um, budget or the largest portion of that 75 million, and that's 40%. Um, and then 2E bond fund is next at 30%. And I broke out some of the um, other funds because a couple of them are bigger than the others, but the CIP budget is 14%, open space budgets 5% recreation center is 3% and the other five, I guess, funds that are left over are only 1% of that total, so they're pretty small. So just focusing on the general fund now, um, that 47% of that 75 million. Um, in 2019, we're projecting um, about $35 million, $35.5 million in revenues. Um, we're projecting to have a, a fund balance at the beginning of next year of just over 13 million, so total available funds of 48.8 million for 2019. Um, the revenues are um, about a 1.5% increase compared to what we're estimating to bring in at the end of this year, um, but it's a 3.8% increase compared to what we originally budgeted in the 2018 budget. Um, so a little bit of increase in revenues for the general fund. Again, broken down graphically, um, I think you all know and understand, we, we kind of drill this into you every year and, and, and to our citizens that um, sales and use taxes is, is a primary revenue source for the city. Um, so over 70% um, of our revenues come from sales and use tax. And uh, a little piece of that pie I always like to point out too, because a lot of people don't know, is property tax is only 3% of our revenue, so very small revenue source. Um, and then there, there's, there's several other different categories there. All these revenues are broken down um, under the uh, tab in your book, uh, Revenues and Expenditures. So if you have any questions about them, you can look in there or um, we can ask, answer those questions for you. So uh, this is a new slide I started last year. This is just um, a financial health of the city um, graph um, sent post-recession, so about 2009-ish. Um, some will argue that maybe the recession wasn't quite over yet, but that's kind of when um, it started um, ticking back up. And you can see here, it, it took a couple years for the city um, to really start seeing um, growth in revenues. Um, 2013 was really the first year that we kind of saw a significant increase, um, a little bump in, in revenues, and then they've been increasing every year since. Um, and so the green line is, is the, the ongoing revenues that we receive on an annual basis, and then the, the orange bar on top are um, some one-time revenues. Um, that we would get on an annual basis, or that we project to get annually, um, depending on what year it is. Um, 2019, we're, we have some one-time revenues we're projecting, um, st still getting, believe it or not, some money, insurance um, proceeds for, for the hailstorm, we're estimating about 570000 still coming in in 2019. Um, and let's see what else, I guess that's, that's really it for 2019. Um, for the one-time revenues that we're projecting. But fairly good growth in revenues, um, uh, at least since 2013. And the next slide, if I can get to it. So general fund, again, focusing on general fund, these are expenditures that we're proposing. Um, again, just over 35 and a half million, so we're presenting a balanced budget. Um, 
we uh, put together a budget that matches the revenues that we project to come in for 2019. So not um, taking any money out of reserves to balance the general fund budget. We are, though, taking, uh, proposing to take $4 million out of the general fund reserves um, as transfers to other funds. Uh, $3 million of that is to the CIP capital project budget. Um, 900000 to the open space for the green project on 38th Avenue and 100000 to our equipment replacement fund. That's a fund we set up to uh, save money um, so that we have money um, set aside for large equipment replaces, replacements over the years, such as police radios um, or large, now that we don't have a dispatch center. Um, that was kind of one, I think one of the first reasons we set that up is we, we, we knew we were going to have some very large expenses coming up for our communication center, millions of dollars to replace our communication center, but um, we won't have that expense anymore. But uh, financial management um, software system for the city is, is hundreds of thousands of dollars, so um, that's what that fund is set up for. We usually put about 100000 into that a year. Uh, expenditures are um, about a 1.2% increase compared to um, the 2018 budget. Um, if you factor out the hailstorm expenses, both in 2018 and 2019, it's about a 3.5% increase. Um, this will leave us with an ending fund balance of $9.3 million, um, and the unrestricted portion of that is about $6.9 million, which is a 19.4% um, fund balance. Uh, what's in that restricted portion of that fund balance is uh, just over a million dollars for the Tabor 3% reserve, emergency reserve that we, that we required to hold back, um, $248,000 for um, PEG fees, uh, public education government fees that we collect for um, this system in here, the camera system, um, and then $1,085,000 um, for the loan to Fruitdale that we still have outstanding. If you remember, we, got, we did get repaid $1.5 million this year, but we still have, this, the city has $1,085,000 left on that loan, so that's part of our restricted fund balance. So again, that leaves an unrestricted of about 6.9, which city council can choose to use at their discretion, down to 17%. <laughs> Um, so, uh, 2019 general fund expenditures graphically here, um, I don't think this chart changes ever. Um, it's always about the same. Police department is always about 30%. Um, parks and public works are always about tied 15 to 14%. Um, administrative services, all of our internal functions are, are 12%. Central charges is all of our, um, general fund employee, um, health and medical benefits, um, are, uh, workers' comp insurance, our property liability insurance, and some other um, uh, charges that um, across every department in the city. General government is, is city council budget, city manager, city attorney, city clerk, city treasurer, economic development um, at 9%, and then community development 5%, and municipal court 3%. Cheap side. Yeah, cheap side of the table over here, I heard. Um, and this is a similar. Um, display as for revenues this is expenditures again um kind of a fiscal health model um again post-recession 2009 ish um you can see uh again some one-time expenditures uh in 14 through 2019 um, a lot of those um are for different purposes most recently in 2019 we're projecting that those are um let's see got my notes here 2000, whoops. Yeah, 2019 is um, just under a million dollars of, of hailstorm repairs um, we still have to do in, in 2019. And um, we have about $665,000 worth of TIF payments um, for some of our different projects. Those are um, all one time expenses. Um, but as you can see, um, revenues or expense, expenses have increased obviously over the years um, since 2000. Nine um, over $12 million. Um, over that same period, um, cumulative inflation was about 20%, so that's about $4.6 $4. million of that increase, $4.6 million. Um, we've, we've increased um, staffing, about 23 FTEs over that time period. We've had significant increase in economic development activity um, over the, those years also. Those are some of the reasons for that increase. 
So that was the general fund. Moving on to some of the other funds now. Um, this is the, the 2E fund. Um, we are projecting um, available funds in 2019 of just over $33 million um, and expenditures of $22 million. And the projects, we'll get into a little bit more detail here what they are, but for 2019, the largest expenses we're projecting are for the Gold Line Station. 37% um, of that um, 22 million is for, for that project, 23% for the, the hook ramps at the Clear Creek Crossing project, 13% for the Wadsworth um, project, 11% for Anderson Park, and 16% for debt service. And you can see the debt service payment for 2019 is, is um, just under $3.5 million. So those projects, um, as you all know, again, the Clear Creek Crossing hook ramps, um, we have $5 million um, budgeted next year for that. Scott, did you want to kind of give a quick update maybe on those expenses, the hook ramp expenses? Sure, yeah, yeah, Clear Creek Crossing for the uh, hook ramp, hook ramp and sp um, hook ramp expenses. Sorry, I'm a little jet lagged here. <laughs> um, this basically covers the infrastructure roadway work needed to uh, uh, complete the hook ramps and reconfigure the access between I-70 and 32nd Avenue. And that's uh, basically um, the extension of um, what we call um, um, Clear Creek, or um, Cabela, it says Cabela's Drive on the, on the map, but we're calling that Clear Creek Crossing Drive uh, from 32nd up to where the hook, hook ramps are going to start. Um, then the hook ramps, and then that includes uh, some redoing the uh, existing interchange at uh, 32nd and I-70 um, um, with, with the ramps there. Um, I can get into more detail on that if there's questions, but that's, that's the basics of the 2E expenditures on Clear Creek Crossing. Uh, for the G-Line station, it's... Uh, Scott, Ken's going to go over that. Oh. We'll have, we'll have Ken go over that. I think he's all prepared, but thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Give you a break. <laughs> uh, so the Wheat Ridge Ward G Line Station, um, again, we're projecting to spend 8.3 million. I'll let Ken explain that. Yeah, we uh, we have been at the staff level meeting monthly for quite some time now, uh, and prior, among other things, prioritizing which projects might make the most sense for the city uh, to fund through TUI. I think for the for the funds in uh, next year's budget, uh, those are mostly road projects. So uh, improvements to 52nd Avenue, which is a, a high priority. Uh, improvements to Ridge Road, uh, potentially over to Ward Road, and then extending to the city's uh, eastern boundary. Um, and then also uh, improvements to Tabor Street. So that's about 6.3 million of that 8.3 million mon uh, amount. Uh, and then 1.3 million is designing those projects, uh, and about 750,000 is acquiring right away for those projects. That, that'll leave a little over 4 million left. Um, and still obviously looking for opportunities to leverage that with other grants and other funding sources to maximize, maximize that money. Um, the, just to, while we're giving an update on that, the, uh, you know, we're certainly in active communications with both the property owners where the potential uh, regional park associated with the ponds were located on the vision plan. Uh, we don't have um, partnerships to, for those to become regional parks at this point doesn't mean there might not be significant opportunities to make them regional amenities uh, and take advantage of the water asset, but maybe in partnership with them as private uh, development occurs. Still looking at the pedestrian bridge and the linear park, and that's really what we're reserving the balance of the money for. Uh, and we have uh, AECOM under contract to start that uh, design and, uh, and preliminary budgeting work um, as we speak. Great, thanks, Ken. Um, and then the final two 2E two projects um, on the next slide uh, are the, the Wadsworth Boulevard widening project. Um, that's um, $7 million um, come from the 2E fund and about $3 million we have budgeted for next year. And, and Scott can give you a brief update on that if you would. Uh, sure. The, uh, uh, the uh, 2E money we have for uh, uh, the Wadsworth Boulevard project is to cover that gap that uh, uh, we have with funding the project. Um, as you may recall, we have $25 million in federal TIP funds. Uh, CDOT is making some contributions. We've cobbled together some uh, other funding sources, but still had a, 
uh, you know, a gap, $10 million or $7 million gap left from, um, you know, after going through the, uh, the PEL and the EA and so forth and um, um, getting the design itself a little more, more uh, in focus here. So um, in the coming year here, we'll be um, using funds to, um, this gets into the CIP part of it a little more, but we'll be wrapping up the environmental assessment, starting the final design for the project, and then also beginning the uh, process for right-of-way acquisition. Thanks, Scott. And then the final and fourth project um, under 2E fund is Anderson um, Park um, reconstruction, and uh, you pr pr approved that contract last week, I, th I believe, right? And Joyce, do you have any uh, quick updates on that? Or you just gave an update last week, so you may not have much to add. All right, then I won't go through all of the uh, renovations we're doing in Anderson Park since we did cover that last week, but just want to invite you to the Anderson Demo Day Wednesday morning at 1030 and come and get a sledgehammer and help knock one of the walls down. So we're excited to get started. They are down there already working, working on stormwater management and et cetera. Great. Thank you. And then moving on to another fund, the Capital Improvement Program funds. Um, we are uh, projecting expenditures of about ten and a half million, um, revenues of about the same, and we are proposing, as I mentioned earlier, to transfer three million dollars from um, general fund reserves um, to the CIP budget to help with with these expenditures, and um, that's up quite a bit. We we normally transfer um, anywhere from two and two and a half million, so we've had some additional funds that we were able to transfer, so it's it's um, enabling us to get quite a few more capital projects done, which Scott can um, talk about in a bit, but um, this graph here just shows you what the majority of that funding is going towards, um, and for 19, it's, it's again, the Wadsworth um, construction, so 65% of the budget is going towards that. Um, and then we have um, other street projects is the next largest at 7.4%, but then, what, I'm sorry, preventative street maintenance, our annual uh, asphalt overlay and um, concrete repair and slurry seal program is about 19%. And, um, and then we have other street projects, um, some municipal capital projects, drainage facilities, traffic, economic development, and utility projects, which we'll talk about in more detail here in a bit. <clears throat> And uh, just a another um, fiscal health chart. This is specifically on the CIP budget. This just kind of, I like how this visually shows kind of the um, sporadic nature of the CIP budget based on project needs and, and actually budget. Um, the, the green um, portion of the bar is the budget for that year from the CIP and the orange again is, is, um, is the transfers from the, the general fund. So we've been able to give more depending on the year um, and also, we've been able to do more depending on the number of grants um, we've received for um, CIP projects, and we've received quite a few over the years. So now on to um, some of the CIP major projects, and um, I'll let Scott um, run through these, and, um, uh, or, and anybody else that has a project in CIP budget can jump in. Yeah, I'll just run through these real quickly. Uh, these first three you see up here. Uh, Wadsworth environmental assessment I just mentioned briefly um, uh, those monies will also be used to um, do the final design construction plans and then also start right-of-way acquisition uh, 1.9 million preventive street mil street maintenance uh, that amount is pretty consistent with what we've budge budgeted each year under this roughly around two million two million dollars give or take uh, which includes our mill and overlay projects uh, slurry seal and crack filling uh, bridge maintenance, uh, we broke this out into a um, kind of a new separate item on its own for this year. Um, in the past, we've typically um, lumped uh, expenditures with this in with our preventive maintenance project, but uh, um, with our bridge inspection program, which happens uh, once every two years, um, we're trying to be a little more deliberate and intentional about getting some of these maintenance needs on the bridges done uh, proactively. and. Um, spending a little bit more money projecting and um, have broke that out in a separate item. So, um, um, so we're, we're uh, that'll be a lot of uh, mostly uh, updates to some of the joints and the bridges, um, you know, repairing concrete spalling, some railings, those kinds of things. Nothing major, but preventive maintenance we do need to do on the bridges. Um, next slide here. Uh, City Hall improvements, uh, 
those are funds uh, resulting from the risk assessment that was done by our um, um, consultant that did a security assessment. If you want to expand on that, Joyce, at all. So we have um, some space planning and security um, recommendations that we are budgeted for 2019 to improve the security for walk-in traffic on both the first and second floor. There, there's also the um, uh, court security upgrades um, is in that budget and some uh, improvements to the uh, sidewalks outside of City Hall, uh, um, specifically on the um, police department side to repair um, cracks and, and trip hazards. Okay, uh, moving on, miscellaneous dra drainage improvements. Um, this is a budget we typically have every year uh, for um, pretty close to this amount. Uh, this year, the, the biggest, or next year in 2019, the, the larger of the projects will be at 26th and Fenton. Uh, a joint project with the city of Edgewater to do some improvements there where, where we've had some uh, uh, drainage issues. Uh, we also use money from this fund to do um, you know, miscellaneous upgrades to our system. Say we have failing culverts and um, ones that are large enough or more complex enough that our maintenance ops folks um, cannot fix. Typically they do these kinds of things when they can, but uh, this provides some additional monies to contract work out if we need to do that. Uh, Clear Creek Crossing, the amount there, this is mainly for uh, support services related to Clear Creek Crossing uh, that are not 2E related. Um, there are going to be some um, streets built in the project, uh, drainage improvements, storm sewer and so forth that will be owned and maintained by the city. Uh, so therefore we need to make sure that everything is reviewed and constructed appropriately inspected. So. Uh, these are some extra monies for that. Um, and then the sidewalk gaps, bicycle pedestrian enhancements for $100,000. Um, a lot of these are related to development, uh, op where we have uh, uh, developments going on and it provides an opportunity where uh, the city can leverage some, some funds to do additional pr uh, improvements where we can plug up or close sidewalk gaps um, and do some other improvements. Um, moving to... And okay, apologize, some of you may have, I, we just realized that your PowerPoint pack got cut off some some reason. Oh. Mine wasn't that way, but, um, or the mayor's, the mayor's got one, but um, if you can follow along. We can sure. get you, we'll, we'll get you the full deck um, afterwards if you'd like it. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, street striping maintenance, uh, we're um, allocating a, a separate budget item of $100,000 for that. Again, th these are expenditures that um, up until now we've, we've lumped in with the preventive maintenance, uh, but as we uh, um, uh, add more uh, in, you know, infrastructure such as bicycle lanes, uh, crosswalks, pedestrian enhancements, we're, we're finding out that we're, we're getting uh, more striping out there to maintain, and it's important that we maintain these well because uh, uh, they, are, they are important to public safety. And, uh, visual looks to the roads and to the uh, community as well. So we want to be a little bit more deliberate, deliberate about getting out and getting that work done. Um, uh, the master plan for the public works and parks operations facility. Um, there was a master plan done, I want to say back in the early 2000s, uh, uh, that proposed some uh, major improvements and upgrades to the facility there. Um, uh, facility is very old and aging, was built uh, decades ago, I'm not even sure what year, but uh, uh, nothing, little if anything has been done since the last master plan was done, so uh, this provides some monies to uh, uh, perhaps take the old uh, master plan off the shelf, dust it off, and um, get back to work on that and make some needed upgrades to meet, um, you know, current code uh, requirements, ADA, and so forth. Um, bike pet improvements, we have $90,000 in there to do uh, some improvements. The main uh, project we have proposed for next year is to do some bicycle lanes on Garrison Street north of 44th up to uh, uh, the Arvada border and would include some, um, some improvements to the uh, uh, intersections there uh, where Garrison goes under I-70, some additional curb work to channel the uh, traffic and the bike lanes a little better. 
Uh, moving on, traffic signal improvements, $60,000 in there. We have a uh, kind of an aging signal system out there that we're trying to keep upgraded and up to date. Uh, ADA improvements, $50,000 uh, to uh, provide upgrades and uh, uh, new infrastructure as needed to uh, meet the uh, requirements and priorities that we set up in our um, ADA uh, uh, improvement plan that was completed a year or so ago. Um, this amount, we've, we, the 50000 is uh, pretty consistent with what, we, what we've budgeted each year since we developed that plan. Uh, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, um, this is uh, to address our requests for um, um, neighborhood traffic control such as speed humps, uh, traffic calming. And then aerial photography, GIS, this is uh, some additional monies to uh, keep our records up to date, our mapping. Uh, uh, whether that's utilities, uh, property lines, um, a lot of uh, uh, data that's very useful um, to meet legal requirements and provide accurate information to people that use that info. Uh, gateway signage, uh, we uh, completed a lot of the gateway signage work previously. Um, we're putting some, keeping some monies in there for uh, possibly some uh, additional gateway signage at 26th and Kipling. Um, and I think that's about the only place we we're looking at right now, although there are other opportunities if um, council would want to entertain those, but that's we're focusing on that intersection, hopefully maybe getting something in this year, next year. Uh, Clear Creek Master Plan is uh, monies to assist us with our um, uh, work on getting the FEMA flood maps updated. We're working in cooperation with uh, Golden, Adams County, um, City and County De Denver, um, all the other agencies that, that border uh, Clear Creek there uh, to get those maps updated, which is very important because it uh, um, has strong implications on flood insurance for a lot of folks. So um, it'll be good to get that done and it'll be real helpful to a lot of people. And then our neighborhood street, uh, skipping one here, um, neighborhood street light program, that's uh, some monies we put in there each year for neighborhood street light requests. Um, and then easements and right away, uh, that's some additional monies if we need it for uh, say miscellaneous projects uh, such as uh, undergrounding of power lines with XL. Um, if there's some additional easements or right away needed for that, it, gives us a little extra cushion there. Thank you, Scott. Um, and then you look at, as you see in your budget book, we put together a 10-year CIP budget. Um, the council's not um, officially taking action on the out years, but um, we do this for planning purposes. Uh, if you look out the, the 10 years, we um, are showing a transfer of three million annually from the general fund reserves for CIP projects. Um, and we have several line items that are consistent throughout the throughout the 10 years. Uh, preventative street maintenance, we're plugging in two million a year. Um, the Wadsworth reconstruction project uh, is budgeted through 2022 for a total of 29 million more than what's already in the budget. Um, and then other um, annual project funding for drainage, um, development related projects, bike and, bike and ped improvements, we have 450,000 over a five year period. Um, ADA improvements, street lights, bridge maintenance. Bridge maintenance, as Scott mentioned, is, is a new line item we've put in there. Um, we have 1.8 million budget, budgeted over five years based on the needs that we've identified on our, our couple of our bridges that we have in town um, and uh, street striping maintenance and then neighborhood um, traffic management are, um, are all annual projects that we have money allocated towards. Now moving on to um, our open space fund budget. Um, we're projecting um, uh, expenditures of, of just over three and a half million. Um, next year and uh, revenues of 2.3 million and um, I'll let Joyce Manwaring go through uh, what projects are in that budget. So we have three major projects in the open space fund um, budgeted for next year. One is the renovation of Prospect Park phase two at 1.2 million. This is uh, approximately half the um, projected budget for that renovation and it includes uh, four lighted pickleball courts, um, a new pavilion in the south side, a new access road for safety, uh, relocation of the playground away from the trail, et cetera, 
uh, to finish up that project. That project is dependent on the revenues from um, residential developer fees, so our park in lieu of fee uh, that is collected uh, for any kind of residence, I guess, or is that how I would say it? Any subdivision uh, that builds a residence, high density apartment buildings, et cetera. Uh, and, and the sale of, a possible sale of park property on the corner of 38th and Johnson. So this project will be dependent on those two revenues um, being successful or coming in in 2019. We have the renovation of Anderson Park. As you know, we're um, backfilling or subsidizing the bond funds with monies from open space to complete uh, the needed funding for that project. And then the green on 38th Avenue, uh, there's a transfer from the general fund into uh, the open space fund to plan and uh, construct a, a green or public space um, at 38th in front of the Stevens Elementary School. We also have placeholders for open space improvements and park maintenance projects. And there's nothing specific uh, this year for those two amounts. They're used for items that may come up during the year where we might need a new kiosk at a park or something along those lines. So we don't actually spend those monies unless there's something that um, is needed in those two areas. Thank you, Joyce. And then on, moving on to our next fund, Conservation Trust Fund. Um, back to the open space fund, a majority of the revenues that for the open space fund come from the, the county tax, open space tax, um, and, and other grants and such. The Conservation Trust Fund, the majority of, those, of the revenues come from the Colorado uh, lottery dollars, that, um, the city's portion of those. Um, we're proposing expenditures of just uh, over 303000 next year, and I'll let Joyce explain those. Okay, so again, um, we're backfilling the bond funds um, with monies from the Conservation Trust Fund to meet the projected expenditures. Um, and those funds will be for the renovation of it, the Anderson Building itself. Uh, we're also um, have been um, allocating funding in the Conservation Trust Fund for Recreation Center CIP or maintenance projects. Um, that 103 1,700 represents um, for 2019 refinishing of the wood floors, um, new uh, fitness equipment, um, new pumps, uh, possible improvements to the HVAC, etc. And then we have a new playground. The recreation center will be 20 years old in 2020, and the playground that's located on the northeast corner. Um, needs to be replaced. So we have that budgeted in the Conservation Trust Fund as well at 100000 And then every year we do annual maintenance on our outdoor tennis and basketball courts. We crack seal them or resurface them or repaint them, whatever's needed. Panorama Park will be the focus in 2019. Um, and then the last fund that we're going to um, speak about in detail tonight is the uh, uh, Recreation Center Funds. and. Um, we have uh, almost two and a half million um, proposed as expenditures. And as you can see, the Indian fund balance um, for 2019 is proposed at about $12,000. So um, we've been speaking about this for the last several years with you, that we were going to get to a point where that fund balance was, was going to decrease. Um, and uh, Joyce and her staff have been doing numerous things to address that. and. Um, and you know I can let her speak to that, but right now expenditures um, exceed revenues, um, pretty much about two hundred thousand a year, um, and it's depleting the fund balance. And um, maybe I'll let Joyce. You want to speak to those those last three bullet points of things you've been working on? Yes. Well, as I mentioned, we've been over the last few years transferred the cost of the large maintenance items in the Recreation Center to the Conservation Trust Fund. That's an appropriate expenditure for that fund, uh, and that's been able to carry the load, and I see that continuing in the future um, to help with that uh, cost. The building, of course, is, again, 20 years old, so it's starting to need uh, some additional maintenance. Uh, we've either been fortunate or unfortunate in some respects with um, our hailstorms because we were able to 
a few years ago, get a new roof for the recreation center. So that's, that's the good and bad news of that. Uh, but we have a five-year capital improvement plan that we're following. Uh, let's see. Uh, we are in the process of completing the market analysis and developing a new fee policy, which we'll be bringing to council later in the fall. And really, um, just a brief description of that program is it is a software program where you, um, the program is built to accommodate or account for all of the costs that um, you incur to provide a certain service or a program. And then you can look at that data and decide um, or really know what it costs you in detail to say offer yoga or provide a park pavilion in the park. And then you can compare that to some of the market analysis for fees. But even as a larger part of that, um, it develops a fee policy philosophy about what type of programs you want to subsidize and what type of programs um, are appropriate to charge higher fees for that have more individual benefit. So right now our fee policy is pretty much straight across the board. It's cost plus. Uh, this new fee policy that we'll be presenting to you will be cost plus based on a philosophy of individual benefit versus community benefit. So we're really taking a hard look at that. We know fees are important. Most of the recreation programs in the general fund recoup about 30% of their costs. Um, and then the Recreation Center, of course, uh, has not been able to be self-sufficient. Uh, and that's due to really personnel costs. And uh, with the new minimum wage law, uh, that has impacted, if you can imagine, our 300 part-time employees. Um, most of them were at minimum wage or above. So there's been some significant um, financial impacts in that area in the Recreation Center Fund. Thank you, Joyce. Um, so moving on to um, some other budget strategic priorities that, that we may not have talked about yet that are included in the 2019 um, proposed budget. Um, our annual funding funding to the, Ur the Wheat Ridge Urban Renewal Authority of $300,000 for them to perform um, their duties. Um, this year, or 2019, we're projecting that um, our TIF dollars uh, for our, our TIF um, projects are about 665000 and um, those are for um, the Kipling Ridge project and the, the Wheat Ridge Corners project. And I believe a portion of that will be for the, the, um, the West End 38th, 38th project on, on Upham and 38th. Um, those, those are a, a wash, basically. We have to show them as an expense, but um, those are sales, new sales tax dollars coming in from those projects. But that's the amount that we've committed to um, paying back to those projects in 2019. Um, Ridge at 38th Avenue, uh, um, public events uh, is 160,000 is, is um, what Local Works is asking for. Um, the Wheat Ridge Business District grant program, we, ha we do have currently have 45,000 in the budget. Mr. DeMott um, just spoke earlier asking potentially for a, a, a pinch, uh, another 40,000 um, for that for the facade plus program. Um, our live local events uh, for local works is forty thousand um, dollars. The building up business loan program or bubble for local works is eighty thousand um, dollars. In our economic development budget, we have uh, funds to help market um, so most or several of our commercial corridors. Forty fourth Avenue has um, seventy five hundred dollars. The twenty ninth Avenue marketplace has five thousand. Thirty eighth Avenue is thirty thousand. Um, we always try to do a, a new planning um, effort um, every year in a different corridor of the community and community development um, would like to do some type of sub area plan or a different type of planning effort for the 44th Avenue corridor next year. Um, we currently have a Fruitdale plan that was done, I'm not sure how old that is now, 2006 that was done. Um, it, was, it was kind of done very quickly and, and with honestly with not a whole lot of um, discussion and, and thought so um, we believe it's um, time for an update to that one this year we're, we're working on we had monies for a Kipling corridor um, plan which we're currently working on um, to look at that so um, some other things um, continuation of our TLC program 30,000 that local works helps helps us with those programs um, we do have a separate budget to manage and maintain our historic 
Park and our historic buildings of 83,850. Whoops, I have 44th in there twice, I think, looks like. We're not double budgeting that, but can slip that in at the last minute. Um, and let's see, last track here. Uh, large item pickup is an annual program we do for our residents to um, get rid of some large trash items. That's $5,000. Uh, Carnation Festival of 80,000 is what's in the budget. Um, I believe they are requesting an additional um, 20 to 45,000 um, for the 50th Carnation Festival. Um, and we, we do have, um, we budget for staff over time for the Carnation Festival because it is pretty staff intensive. So there's about just over 25,000 that we budget for staff over time for that. We are bringing, gonna try to bring back a Citizen Academy um, this next year if we can get participants. Um, so we have 5,000 budgeted for that. This, or your um, outside agency Citizen Review Committee has recommended um, funding of $133,410 to outside agencies. Um, there's a list in, your, uh, in the budget message. Um, we have $60,000 uh, for the Wheat Ridge 50th anniversary celebrations throughout the year. Um, then on to fleet replacements. Um, Scott can answer any questions if you have here, but we, we do have a, a, um, guidelines in place that City Council adopted a few years ago. Um, we, we follow those guidelines. The guidelines are based on age and mileage hours of, of per units. Um, 2019, we're proposing 851,728 in, in fleet replacement. Um, a good chunk of that is for a snowplow um, in the Public Works Department, which is $220,000. Public Works has a lot, a lot of large pieces of equipment, which are very expensive, and we try to get at least one replaced if needed every year. Last year we got, or this year we got a, a new street sweeper replaced. Um, and um, so next year we would like to get a new snowplow in there. That's about 220. They have a couple other vehicles, so about 264,000 in Public Works. Parks Department um, has $160,000 worth of vehicles, um, replacements, and four new vehicles for um, some new employees that we're requesting. Police Department has um, just over $426,000 of, of replacement vehicles, and also three new vehicles um, for some new employees, and then also a new vehicle for our current community services team. Um, we've identified about $1.7 in vehicle replacements um, for the next um, several years, which we will be bringing back to you as those budget cycles come. Um, now to get into to staffing changes, um, we are asking for a net increase of, of nine um, FTEs um, in 2009 and um, have pretty good detailed descriptions in, in your budget message that explain the justifications for these, but I'll let the department directors um, talk to these um, briefly here tonight too. Um, in the Parks Department, um, we're asking for two uh, park maintenance, one workers, um, one FTE forestry assistant, and one FTE horticulturalist assistant. And Joyce, do you want to talk about those four positions, the justification? Well, the two uh, park maintenance worker ones are entry-level positions. They basically do mowing, um, bathroom cleaning, trash removal, pavilion cleaning. And we've added several new parks, and with the renovation of Anderson as well as Prospect, um, it's time. We've requested these. I think this is either the, probably the third year in a row. We're just not able to keep up um, with the maintenance of, of our parks in the, in the, at the quality level we'd like to. The forestry assistant we're requesting just we would like to continue to improve and rebuild our forestry program. During the 2002 layoffs, um, we lost our city forester, and the program really hasn't um, grown or, um, I said, be, be maintained. Our urban uh, forest uh, been maintained at the quality we'd like to see. We have one forestry assistant who oftentimes has to work alone, and this is also a safety issue uh, for the city. And then our horticultural assistant, um, we have one of those, and we've added many planting beds in these new parks, as well as the plants along 38th Avenue. And it just isn't possible to keep that up in all areas and keep all the shrub beds and flower beds planted. Uh, they, the other really uh, cyclical piece of this is we've had uh, a difficult time with the labor market 
um, hiring seasonals to help with this work. So that is the request for our FTEs. Thank you, Joyce. And then the police department is requesting uh, two, two additional police officers, um, a one person's detective and one special investigations sergeant. Mr. Brandon. So the uh, two additional patrol officers are related to the development that we're seeing in the city, particularly the northwest corridor of the city and the proposed build out of both uh, the Clear Creek Crossing and uh, the G Line. Uh, uh, the plan right now is to, uh, uh, it takes us about 18 months to recruit and hire and then train. Uh, a patrol officer so uh, with the build out both of the G line and the opening proposed you know this year and then subsequent build out some of the residential uh, uh, developments that are occurring there residential developments that are occurring in other parts of the city as well as what we anticipate seeing Clear Creek Crossing the idea is to add two patrol officers we'd add one patrol officer to our swing shift on both end of the week so we can increase our staffing uh, we generally see our calls for service increase around uh, uh, 10 a.m., uh, 11 a.m. in the morning until about 8 or 9 at night. So that would allow us to, uh, to handle uh, the what we propose to be increases in calls for service as a result of, of the development that's, that's occurring. We're going to continue to look at uh, how we're going to staff uh, the, uh, the new developments that may uh, require the uh, implementation of a new beat plan that adds a beat for the northwest corridor of the city specifically to, to handle that particular area, just, just due to the types of development that we anticipate seeing there. But uh, we're working closely with Community Development City Manager's Office to, to look at those proposed changes. The uh, Persons Detective and the Special Investigations Unit Supervisor were all part of the uh, 2016 uh, study that we had done by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. If you recall, they uh, uh, had recommended the hiring uh, or the addition of six additional uh, 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 sworn positions, four patrol officer positions to handle our current call calls for service. They also recommended a person's detective to handle exclusively uh, domestic violence kinds of investigations, persons kinds of investigations. And then they recommended a, another patrol commander. Uh, we uh, feel a little bit differently, uh, although I'd love to have another patrol commander. What I really need is a, uh, is a sergeant to supervise our special investigation teams. We have two detectives assigned to the West Metro Drug Task Force, another detective assigned to the Metropolitan Auto Theft Task Force. That's a grant-funded position uh, that we get reimbursed for. And then we have a, uh, a detective, uh, a new detective slot that we got uh, two years ago, the vice intelligence function to help us uh, deal with, uh, you know, the counterterrorism piece as well as, you know, uh, things related to uh, vice, so prostitution, alcohol, marijuana, and those kinds of things. Right now, they're being supervised by my uh, investigations commander, uh, who's got responsibilities, uh, uh, you know, to oversee a uh, an investigations bureau, and uh, his span of control is uh, is past the max. So, this would give me the opportunity to have a a, a sergeant who could. Uh, oversee our drug investigation cases, assist West Metro with the larger scale drug investigations, as well as oversee the counterterrorism and the vice components in the Metropolitan Auto Theft Task Force Detective. So uh, we're making a request for that position. The persons detective, uh, you know, I touched on a little bit in terms of focusing on domestic violence. That's becoming more critical as the county, uh, as the DA's office actually moves forward with this family justice. Uh, center and uh, some of the uh, some of the services that they would like to offer through that uh, that center, I think, will eventually place more demands overall on on uh, my uh, persons detective and the persons unit. So uh, we handle uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about 350 to 400 domestic violence cases a year, plus another uh, 300 to 350 uh, domestic disturbance calls. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of our misdemeanor calls or misdemeanor domestic violence cases uh, are assigned to our patrol division and some of those become pretty complicated kinds of cases and this detective would be able to assist with those as well. Be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. 
Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, Chief, I remember earlier a discussion about a community service vehicle. Is that, it, it, uh, is that one of the three you're asking for now? The community services vehicle is for our community services team. Uh, the staffing uh, in that team uh, is now at seven community service officers and a supervisor, and there are days of the week when we just don't have enough vehicles to... Uh, so is that vehicle in a different part of the budget then, or is that... Well, no, it's, it, it, it was listed up there. The one, there are three vehicles that, uh, that we're asking uh, uh, for, I believe, Patrick had in his budget. One is a community services vehicle. We have a patrol vehicle uh, uh, that we're requesting, and then a vehicle for our special investigations unit supervisor, and one for uh, uh, the persons team, an additional vehicle for the persons team. So I think there's four vehicles listed in there, right? Uh, just three. 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 Just three. So no, we don't have the patrol vehicle now. Then all your replacements. We have one patrol. Okay. One for the, the sergeant, and then one for CSO. Okay. Thanks. So. So you have three requested, which includes the community service vehicle. Yes. Uh, tell me my math is wrong, but uh, do we? According to my math, that's one hundred and forty-two thousand dollars per vehicle. Is that right? For for a police vehicle? Yeah. No. Oh, that's total replacement. No, that's it's total replacement for all our vehicles plus the replacement. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I probably didn't explain that. Vehicle. The four hundred twenty-six five hundred thousand is is yeah. Just as the chief said, we we have annual replacement vehicles based on age and miles. Um, of that four hundred twenty-six, three of them are, are new vehicles. That's what that note is. The new vehicles, a patrol vehicle, is about fifty-seven thousand for to be totally outfitted with lights and and all the equipment it needs. Um, and um, so, yeah. So how many obsolete vehicles are being replaced? Um, let's see, I can pull that up here. It's down here. For the PD, specifically? Mm -hmm. We have, let's see, replacements we have PD, we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, six replacements, and then um, three new vehicles. So those are all police cars? Yes. Well, patrol, I mean, patrol vehicles, there's, there's vehicles. patrol marked vehicles, there's a patrol unmarked, there's an investigation unmarked car. Um, but yeah, they're for the police department, not just patrol cars, but for investigation um, folks too, detectives. Okay. What, what is your goal? Is your goal to have a separate vehicle for every police officer? Oh, absolutely not. If, if I did, you'd, you'd have a, uh, 100 vehicles. So we're not anywhere, anywhere close to 100 vehicles. Um, you know, when we, uh, when we staff the street, uh, uh, you know, during our overlap periods, we'll have anywhere from 12 to 17 vehicles, uh, patrol vehicles that are out. I think our current vehicle fleet's uh, right over 20 uh, vehicles, so we have just, just enough for the next shift to come on. Uh, after overlap for investigations, we have one vehicle for about every two detectives and in our community services unit, uh, we probably have uh, uh, about uh, uh, three quarters of vehicle for, for each employee. So the staffing there will, uh, will depend. Uh, in, in patrol, we staff seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Community services is seven days a week, about 16 to 18 hours a day. So uh, you either double up employees, and so you're less effective and efficient, or you have enough vehicles that you can get uh, officers out on the street. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then the final two uh, positions we're, we're requesting are part-time positions. They're, they're currently part-time positions. We're asking them to go to full-time. Um, one is um, an IT support technician. Um, we were pretty overrun this year, especially, um, but it is an ongoing um, need. Um, th this IT support technician is, is the one person that we have who supports um, employees at their desk for their desktops if they're having issues on, in printers and such like that. The rest of our employees, that are other, what do we have? Um, one, a manager and th three, three uh, network administrators. Um, they are doing more strategic projects. This last year was the, um, 
consolidation of our uh, records, our communication center, which was very time consuming in our records management system. Um, it really pulls um, those people away from working on more strategic projects and having to go to desk to do desktop help support. So we'd recommend a half, increasing that employee to a full time from half time. And the other um, position is the digital communications specialist. Um, we, that's Bridget, if you met her, she, we currently, um, she's half time. Um, we'd like that to go to full time. Um, we really are starting to see a lot of improvements in our community outreach. We've been getting a lot of compliments on our social media for the amount of information we're getting out. And um, we still need to do more work on our website to make sure that we're keeping um, being as transparent as possible and, and um, communicating with our public as much as possible. So increasing that position we believe would help us um, with all the different communication tools that we need and, and, and communicating with our, with our community. So on the next slide, um, yes, yes ma'am, yes. I just have a question about staffing then. I mean, we have a public information officer that's full-time, and so is that not something that they can't help with the digital communication staff, or can you explain why we need full-time both those? We do. Um, we have a full-time PIO that represents the whole city, and, and it's half-time that um, uh, reports to the police chief and, and the other half to, to me right now um, was to Heather. But that person um, manages um, a lot of things um, in, a, in a public information um, focus that you would imagine. Um, work does our connections a newsletter that goes out five times a year. Um, all of our press releases um, deals with media contacts. Um, the current halftime person that we have um, primarily works on our website and all of our social media, our Facebook, our Nextdoor, um, getting stuff out on Nextdoor um, app, um, Twitter, um, in any social, social media platform that we have out there. Um, so it's, it's a very busy um, function in the city and it's getting busier. Um, we're, we are being pressured more and more to, to communicate more and more and on more on a timely basis. So it's very difficult right now. I'm not, I'm not honestly proud of, of our website. Um, it's, it needs more attention and um, the PIO doesn't have time to do, do the website work. Uh, moving on to the next slide, so th this is a representation of our staffing levels over the last four years. Um, if you remember, during this year, we, our FTE count actually decreased by, by 18, um, 12 from our communication center um, and six from our building department. We're still paying for those services through contract services. Um, we believe we're going to be paying um, less than what, our, um, what it cost us to pay for those employees when we had them on full time. But we did drop down 18 this year, but we did, had, we did add six, I think, also as part of the 2018 budget. Um, and then again, we're requesting another nine for 2019. So that would leave our total FTE count at 200, just over 234. Um, so um, not much of an increase over the last couple of years with those recent um, uh, deletions of FTEs. And then the next slide is a breakdown of staffing by department. Um, police department has decreased actually a little bit again with um, the communication center being contracted out with Jeffcom so that they're, they're the largest department still of 107 our parks and rec department um, which is is in the, the general fund and the recreation center fund staffing is just over 52 administrative services 23 or public works first is 31 administrative services 23 court 10.25 community development six um, and general government five. Um, next slide we do, you probably can't see this up there, but it's just for show. Um, we do I ask staff to look at staffing needs that they might project for the next five years. Um, all these positions haven't necessarily been fully vetted, but these are just current needs that we project we might need in the next five years based on current workload and, and priorities for city council. We, we've identified identified about 30, 35 FTEs over the next five years that we potentially may, may need to add to the budget. Um, employee benefits highlights for this year. Um, we are on year seven of our pay performance plan and um, we, we budget annually about just, just over 450,000 a year um, to dis distribute throughout um, the departments to provide pay for performance um, increases to employees. It, this averages about a 3% increase 
um, across the board. Employees are eligible for a zero to 5% increase, um, non-sworn off um, employees and our police officers are on a, a step program, which is at about 6.5%, I believe, are their step increases. Um, only in, if employees um, uh, receive a, a satisfactory uh, performance evaluation will they get an increase. Um, we, dis we are f finalizing a market study this year. We do that every other year to make sure that our, um, our job classifications are uh, remaining competitive. Um, as you all know or, or may know, um, it's a very competitive job market right now. It's very difficult to hire people. Um, we need to stay as competitive as possible. Um, it's tough to, to get good talent. Um, the unemployment rate is 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 difficult um, situation right now to get good talent. So it's very important that we stay um, somewhat competitive in the market so that we're we're attracting um, good talent. So one of those um, uh, areas that we were not. Um, competitive in the market, um, which we evaluated, is our retirement contributions. Um, currently, the city contributes 4% uh, of the employee's salary to um, ICMA 401A account. Um, we did an analysis, and we are um, well below the market. The market average for employer contribution to the 401A accounts um, is about 6.2%. Um, so we're, we're proposing that we increase that in the 19 budget from 4 to 6%. Um, that's about $180,000 um, impact on the budget. The, best, the great news for 2019, no increases to any of our medical benefits. Um, that is almost unheard of these days. Um, so we're very proud of that. Um, we have a very good insurance broker that helps us with that. Um, we, we are only with Kaiser right now, so... Um, that sometimes isn't uh, the best option for employees if they don't have options, but um, it's been able us to, enabled us to control our costs over the years by um, remaining with, with, with one. And Kaiser will not um, necessarily sit, or any other insurance company doesn't want to sit along um, aside a Kaiser. Um, so because our, our employee um, group is too small so if you split that employee count between kaiser and say half the employees went to a different like at netna or united healthcare there, there's just not enough employees it's a smaller group so um it's hard to get bids from other insurance um, providers so we've stuck with kaiser for quite some time and uh, we offer a high deductible plan and a deductible hmo plan um, and we also have a very um uh, well participated very high participation in our wellness programs. Um, we provide incentives to employees for those, and I, I really do believe that that's helped us kept, kept our uh, uh, premiums um, at a minimum. Um, so there's no increases to our Kaiser premium for next year, no increases to our dental or our short-term disability or our life insurance. Um, so um, status quo on all of those. So that's, that's very great news. Uh, a few uh, other short-term fiscal notes. I uh, just want to... Um, uh, make public for you guys this evening and send your budget message, but um, sales tax where we are projecting um, about a 5.4% increase compared to what we're estimating this year, so that's that's good news. Um, a good chunk of that, about a third of that co is coming from the Corners Project. Um, and some other good news, um, which is, is coming in the future, I haven't... Um, included any of these other revenues in the 2019 budget, but we are projecting that we will see some additional revenues in 2019 for, from some other projects. The Walmart closure, um, Regency is working on um, backfilling that with four new national tenants. Um, they believe a, a majority of that will be open by the end of the year and port the rest of it by um, beginning of 2020. Um, again, I haven't included those revenues in the budget but we're estimating that those retail tenants should generate anywhere between 800 and 900,000 a year. Um, so if, if they bring in, I've been told that potentially could come in in fourth quarter, so we, we could see an additional two to 300,000 in, in revenues that are not currently projected in the budget. Um, Clear Creek Crossing Project, um, we will be, get reimbursed um, for some expenses that the city has had for the I-70 um, and 32nd Avenue um, environmental assessment project. We, we spent over um, half a million on that and um, it's in our agreement with Evergreen that they will reimburse us for that as soon as they issue their bonds for the project and they are projecting to issue those sometime next year. So I didn't include that revenue source in the budget either. So we should hopefully see that next year. 
Um, so that will be um, some un, un, additional revenues not in the budget. Um, and, and then once the Clear Creek Crossing project is up and running, um, sometime in 2020 or 20, 2021, um, we should start seeing about 1.8 um, million in additional revenues, sales tax, use tax, um, lodging tax, admissions tax um, from that project. So those are revenues that will be um, part of the general fund budget here in not too long. Um, and then a few other uh, small projects that are being done right now, there's just a, a little uncertainty on when they're gonna finish. So again, I didn't include the revenues for these other projects. Applewood Shopping Center has a couple out parcels um, that they're looking at, and that includes the um, Hacienda Colorado. There's a, another fast food joint that might be going in where the Wells Fargo Bank was. Um, the Kipling Ridge project has a tenant in mind for their uh, vacant parcel next to Starbucks. And West End 38 is, is um, projected to have, I think, 8,000 8 to 10,000 square feet of retail um, in their project along 38th Avenue. So um, all of those projects will, are projected to generate about $300,000 a year. Um, again, we just don't know when they're going to come online. They, they probably will be towards the fourth quarter of next year. So um, maybe a portion, maybe another 100, 150000 potentially could come in in 2019 from those projects. Okay, wrapping up here. Um, so opportunities for public input um, on the budget we had included the outside agency committee, which I mentioned earlier, they, they're recommending 133,410 um, in contributions to outside agencies. We had two public input opportunities. Back on July 10th, we had one citizen um, ask for some pedestrian safety improvements on West 38th Avenue. She asked for those again this evening. Um, August 14th, um, we, di we didn't have any citizen comment on the budget that evening. Um, our next steps in the budget process, we're looking for consensus and or other direction on the 2019 budget this evening. Um, we had the request this evening for the Wheat Ridge Environmental Sustainability Committee of 18,000, um, Carnation Festival, Wheat Ridge Business District, and 38th Avenue. Um, some additional requests that are not included in your budget. Um, right now we're scheduled to bring back the budget on October 8th for the official public hearing and adoption of the budget and the certification of the property tax mill levy. With that, we'll open it up for questions. Questions. Thank you, Patrick. Good, uh, good presentation. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess this question is for Patrick. Uh, with respect to the billing department, um, I'm looking at the page 101. It indicates a uh, total uh, expenditures of about 855,000. Um, but based on our contract with uh, Charles Abbott and Associates, my understanding was a portion of our, our fees would be retained while uh, I think it was 68% would go uh, to pay Charles Abbott. But when we look at these expenses here, it doesn't indicate as though we're retaining anything uh, in that department. The, the revenues that you'll see what we're retaining are under the expenditures and revenue section. Um, so the, the plan review fees and um, the, I guess, well, and then a portion, they're not getting any of the use tax, right? So plan review fees and uh, Ken's pulling up to that page, so I'll let him explain it. But so yeah, the, the number that you're referring to on 101 is 855, which is, is lower than what we've been spending um, for the building department um, when we had that in-house, um, but we can go over the revenues too, um, if you'd like, and Kim can explain the, the tiered um, revenue approach that, um, how much we pay based on um, annual uh, work. Yeah, good question, Mr. Urban. So you're, you recalled correctly, it is a tiered fee, fee structure. So uh, on a monthly basis for the first zero to $60,000 in building permit, plan review, and contractor license fees. Those are the three pots of money that we share with them. Uh, they get 68% of those revenues. Uh, if we generate revenues from 60 to 100,000, they get 60% of those additional revenues. And above 100,000, it's uh, 55%. Um, we've had a really strong revenue year in the building division, um, really more non-storm related than storm related. Uh, some big, big projects that we frankly weren't expecting that are uh, soon to go out the door. But I average uh, what that is every month. It's been averaging about $107,000 a month. 
uh, and that reflects a blended rate of about 62%. So that tiered structure is netting out about 62%. Uh, that's the number that we use for budgeting purposes for 2019. So I did my standard uh, estimating of what I thought the trend line was, uh, fairly conservatively as always, of what those three different revenue sources would generate. Uh, and then I took 62% of that as how I generated the proposed budget for Charles Abbott. Okay. And then uh, I see that in the building department we've zeroed out the FTEs, but in the planning department the FTEs are remain the same while the uh, planning review fees are going to Charles Abbott and Associates. So are they uh, doing a, additional work on top of what the four FTEs are, or why do we still have the four FTEs in the planning department when we're asking Charles Abbott and Associates to perform some of those services? Um, probably a couple reasons. Uh, Charles Abbott doesn't really perform any planning functions, so long-range planning, zoning, land use case processing, zoning code amendments, all those things continue to be done by planners. And the planners also still continue to have the role that they have processing building permits. So probably two-thirds of the permits that go out the door uh, also require some sort of a zoning review, whether it's a landscape plan or a lighting plan or making sure it complies with zoning setbacks, et cetera, et cetera. So the 40-ish the or 38 percent that we retain um, from our building permit revenues, I think, really offsets those costs fairly well still. Uh, but the, the, the workload for the planners has not changed at all. Thank you. Additional questions? Ms. Hoppy? I may have a few, but they're kind of all over the board. But I, I would like to ask if I could um, ask Mr. DeMott some questions on his um, Carnation Festival P&L. Mr. DeMott, would you mind going coming to the um, podium? Um, Joe, thanks for putting this together. Yeah. My, what my question is, is I see that the um, circus brings in a revenue of 17320 but then the circus fees, the expenses, are 41750 which puts us 24000 and something upside down with that. Can you talk about why we're carrying such a heavy loss leader with the Carnation Festival? Well, is this on? Um, you know, as we've said, we try to keep it, although a lot of the things in our, our festival are free, we try to keep the things that are paid low. So we did actually lower our ticket prices this year to $10 to get more people to see it. Um, and the reason being is people tend to focus on what we pay the circus as to what we make on the circus. Um, the simple fact is, the circus is the only thing we do make money on. So we spent roughly 20, over $25,000 on music, stage, PA, staffing, things like that. We make $0 on that. So music generally is a $26,000 loss. The semantics of it is, you know, we try to balance that against our beer sales and stuff like that. Um, the circus um, is something that the, the board the festival board feels is a part of our festival um, for you know these few years come well maybe not coming but I can't speak for the board um, but uh, you know the the crowd that goes to the circus um, we just feel that if we eliminated the circus we'd really have a beer garden with music so it's really just, it brings in the crowd that we really want to see, the crowd, the, the part of the city that we feel bring in the kids and stuff, and they want somewhere to go and they can sit down and for 10 bucks for two hours, um, you know, tends to be a, a very cheap um, event for them during the, during the festival. Thank you for answering that for me. Does anybody else want to ask Joe any questions before we make him go sit back down? Mr. Matthews? Joe, could you tell us um, how our attendance at the circus has been doing if we've been keeping some numbers, how many tickets we've sold? Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, obviously when our, when our crowd is high at the festival, we sell out that show. The, the circus tent can be set up for about 700 people. We only have them set it up for about 500. 
So the evening, the later evening shows on Friday and Saturday are always are at, at capacity. Um, the four o'clock show Saturday, they all, they all did really well Saturday. Um, and the early Friday show was at about 65% capacity. Um, the Sunday show, we, um, we were busy because we had some bulk sales that we sold out entire sections of the, to different um, organizations in town and stuff like that. So for the most part, the, uh, the circus across the last, I guess, five years they've been here, it, you know, it, it sort of waned in the middle. And it, in the last year, it came down. I would say it's down about 10% from last year. Um, Attendance-wise, the money was less this year because we did lower the price of the tickets. Thank you. Yeah. Additional questions for Mr. DeMott, uh, Ms. Davis? So I just have kind of a question on that. Yeah. So, Joey, do you think, I mean, it's interesting that we're saying that the circus is a part of the Carnation Festival, considering it hasn't really been there that long. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm all for having some kind of kid events there. Um, I'm all for having two different stages there. If sometimes the stage incorporates some types of kids events or Celtic, I, I know you get kids out there that can do Celtic dances and those types of things. I'm just wondering, is there a, any other kind of draw? I mean, because I mean, I, I understand that that's the only thing we can do that gets money, but that's forty-three thousand dollars. We only get seventeen thousand, so it costs us twenty-five thousand. So I guess indirectly, why not spend twenty-five thousand that might draw other groups, other you know, and you know, more crowds in that still might be family-oriented, kids-oriented. You know, I'm, I'm just wondering if the circus has lived its life because I don't, you know, being a resident of Wheat Ridge all my life, I don't see the Zopi Circus as the Carnation Festival. I mean, I, I do think it, the tent's been cool out there the last few years, but I don't think it's the 50-year heritage of the Carnation Festival. But I do like the kid idea. I'm just wondering if there's some other things we could be or have out there that could draw families any thoughts on that? I mean, I know it's hard and sure, it's got to get tiring and everyone has to put their two cents in. But. No, we always, we always look for new things, you know, and generally what we do is every year, you know, you got to look at when the circus comes in, they bring their own tent. That's a, that's a cost that, you know, our facilities are upwards of $30,000, you know, 37,000, because we have a lot of different things. We have tents and fencing and all that kind of stuff. The circus is truly self-sustaining. They come in, not self-sustaining, that's the wrong word, all, all inclusive. They bring everything. They bring right. their chairs. They bring their tent. They bring their box office. They bring their fencing. So where you would have to bring in a different um, event for younger people, you would then have to also bring in facilities. So it would probably end up being in the $40,000 range. We've looked at some things that tend to be up there in the $40,000 range either way. Um, there was an increase this year for the, for the circus of about $1,600 from years past. Um, but uh, anything that we do that we charge money for or that we try to recoup some money always has that additional upfront expense. So what we try to do, what we really look at ahead of time is, what are we not risking? So they do take some risk with us. Um, and if, it, if we were to have a rain out, we have what we call costs that you know, we cannot recoup. And then we have costs that we will recoup if everything, you know, like it did this year, the weather was great and the attendance was great. And, um, but certain things we take a risk on um, we always plan for the worst and hope for the best. And that, you know, like I say, if, if um, you know, semantics were, I would argue that the music doesn't bring in any money. So that's a, that's a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 guaranteed loss every year because we don't, we don't charge anything for that music. 
Yeah, and I well, guess is there other things? Yeah, we always look for new things, and we're, we're you know, we're always looking for different. And is our different. intent for it to bring in money? I guess that's, no. is that our intent? Because I don't think that's our intent. Our it's intent is to, to have a great time. Money. Right. And, and, and have and a little bit of something for an everybody. audience right. and families. Yeah. I don't think it's to bring in money. Right. Our, um, our, our intent is to celebrate the inception of the city every single right, year. Right. So it's not, you know, we don't look at it as a, a profit center by any means. Right. You know, but we hope that everybody has a heck of a good time. Right. So, and we're always open for suggestions. So thank you. Uh, Ms. Duran. Joe, so the circus has been part of the Carnation Festival for five years. So are you projecting that they're going to stay another two years, three years? Or is that a decision made strictly by the board? Or how does that work? It, it, well, it's been made by the board, yeah, and uh, the, the festival board. And, um, you know, we as a board, we have, you know, usually between 18 and 22, 23 people. Mm -hmm. Um, and last year we, you know, it was, it was unanimous that they came back this year, um, that it is part of our festival. Um, it's a, it's a great part. Um, and I would, I, we haven't, we did have a meeting last week, but we didn't really take consensus on for sure if the if the festival if the circus would be back or not, so it's not a guaranteed thing for next year. But okay, I know everyone looks forward to that circus, just like the music. You know, it draws people in. The circus yep. draws families in. So um, I know that's one thing everybody talks about and looks forward to. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Miss Hoppy. Yeah, I just want to follow up and say, you know, I, um, from the perspective, as you explained it, it's something that brings in the families, and so it's not necessarily something that you're trying to make money on there, but that it's something to enhance the experience, and, and I think that that was a, a good explanation, so thanks, Joe. Thanks. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. DeMott while we've got him at the mic? Thanks, Joe. Uh, additional questions on the budget? Presentation, Ms. Dozman. I have several questions, but I'll start with my easiest one. Um, and it's just a point of clarification. So the assistant to the city manager was moved from the administrative services line item to your city manager budget, right? Yes, and, and any programs and projects that person works on, um, the Citizen um, Academy and um, innovation team, and so those expenses um, related to that position also came over. So that's why you see that large increase. Yes. Okay, and then just uh, one question on the strategic priorities. So that's page fifteen. Um, the Thirty Eighth Avenue marketing for thirty thousand dollars is that in addition to uh, what Local Works has allocated, or is that a part of the Local Works budget? That is what goes to Local Works. That is. Yes. Local Works. Okay. Um, and is that reflected in the? That is in the 105 budget, the economic development budget. Is that what you're asking where it's at? Yeah, uh, because a, a lot of what I'm seeing reflected on the strategic priorities is also a part of the local works budget. So I was just oh, wondering on their if budget. they reflected it in theirs and if it was the 38th Avenue marketing materials of the 30,000 or if it's um, a part of one of the others. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, yes, the one, the 38th Avenue marketing materials. Okay. 30,000, yes. Okay, thank you. We did remove, um, since Local Works did present their budget, uh, we did delete um, 13,750 from their proposed budget for the um, NRS reaffirmation. Um, we didn't feel um, there was an expense that they needed to take on. We, the city, has a uh, pretty comprehensive contract that we're paying for for that process, so we did take 13750 out of their budget. Are you good? Oh, uh, Ms. Oh, uh, she's not done. I can wait. Well, I'll go to Ms. Davis. Okay. Um, so I, ha I have several, you, you guys always know me on these budgets. Um, so 
I have many questions, but one of them I'll start with uh, the 401, the, the contribution of 6%. Um, can I ask you, is that a flat percent or does the employee have to contribute? No, the employee contributes 4% at this point. And then the city would match? Right, right now, the city, the employee contributes four, the um, city um, uh, matches at four, and we're proposing that this, the um, city's contribution goes up to six and the employees can stay at four. And that, that's, um, again, commensurate with what the market is right now, and we, we've really struggled with... But the, probably the municipal market is, would you say? Well, it is, but that's, that's a big, big chunk of our competition, and right. we, we've lost um, several good employees, um, personal uh, well, or potential um, employees because of, of retirement specifically. Um, we can't compete, especially if they're coming from out of state that um, employees have are in para. Um, we just can't compete, um, and we've lost several because of that. All right. Um, and then I would, I would request um, that we go back on the FTEs and see if we could maybe look at that and maybe start with a lower number and then kind of go back with an ask later. I mean, I, I understand, you know, I mean, we're looking at a number and said, w you know, some of this, you know, we had, and, and I know like the parks and maintenance worker and the forestry assistant and the horticulture assistant. I mean, I know when we say, well, we, in 2002, you know, we had, you know, seven of these and now we don't. And I, I'm just wondering if maybe this year we could start with one more and then see how the one more goes, at least like with the park, parks and maintenance worker. I mean, on here we're putting these new positions will also assist in the installation and removal of the new portable fence. Well, you know, first of all, that's probably not gonna be until spring, right? Um, so, that won't even be a part of that. And then our understanding is it's going to be pretty limited. So I guess I'd rather understand how often and time consuming that's going to be before we put that in someone's job description as an FTE. I guess I just want to be really mindful of some of these, especially when we have some of these task force people that have spent so much time, you know, about uh, uh, you know, and making recommendations of, you know, the environmental uh, task force and what they could do that we're going to go and do. And not that these aren't important too. I know it's all important, but I'd rather start with a little chip and say, okay, if we do one parks and maintenance worker and see how that's helped with the new parks. Um, because, you know, if I looked in the budget, there's also six other maintenance workers um, with two, you know, with category two. So that would give us seven maintenance workers to, you know, make sure bathrooms are clean and, you know, do those other things. So I guess my request is, could we go through there and just take another look and say, okay, what do I, I mean, what do I really, really need? Um, I, I, I know how people feel. I just had to do the same thing in my world and had to do a 12% decrease in my budget. So I know how people feel and it doesn't feel good, but sometimes, you know, there are things we can do and, and make it work. Um, so I, I, would, I would like to look at some of these FTEs to see if there's a way we could start with, you know, a couple happy mediums. So that's my feeling, and I know I do this every year. People are like, Christy, you don't know, you don't do their job, you don't understand. Um, and you're right, I don't, but I would like to start with a baby step on some of these. Um, so, so that's one of my first general requests. I think my other general request on this is when I went through and looked at a lot of these um, departments, first of all, a lot of these departments, I wanna say, Thank you, um, and I could I highlighted a few of them uh, because when I looked at their materials and supplies, um, they either broke even or were less. But some of them, um, like, were significantly more. And then I went over the strategic priorities, and I didn't really understand why they were more. And so um, again, I don't, 
and again, it's going to be like, Chrissy, you don't understand. But, um, you know, like for instance, I'm going to just use this one because probably the police chief can give me the example. And, and I guess maybe in the future, but you guys only have one more year that you have to deal with me going line by line on your budget. Um, but like for instance, I'm going to look page 119 under the police department. And I know no one ever wants to pick on the police department. Um, but um, materials and supplies, good job, please, uh, Chief, because materials and supplies, you're down $2,000 from your estimated 2018. So thank you on that. Um, and then other service and charges um, up 45000 So then I want to come over here, and I'm guessing that 45000 might be annual in-service training um, required by post. Um, so I guess those are the kinds of things that I'm looking at some of these, and I don't see what this additional charges are on some of these service and charges and what I want to make sure is when I look at these that I see what our our community is getting for some of these kind of department f charges that are for lack of a better word kind of built in your budget that as as a community they might not see and it could be things that we could save a little bit of money on so that we could help with the environmental committee or a sidewalk or a bike lane or those types of things. So, Chief, what's that for sure. you? Sure. So I can answer that. Uh, you know, here about a month ago, I brought forward a budget supplemental for this year's budget to pay for, you know, the costs associated with recruits to the... Uh, Jefferson County Lakewood Regional Academy. Uh -huh. So next year, uh, I've built that in. We anticipate uh, hiring 12 recruits uh, in 2019. That'll be based on uh, uh, attrition through uh, retirements and resignations. We do a, an attrition survey about every two years uh, to kind of give us an idea of what we'll see. The other thing that we're facing right now, and it, it ties into sort of Patrick's uh, description uh, uh, in, in terms of how competitive the market is. Uh, I've lost three employees this year to larger departments. Uh, they're, they're able to offer much more competitive packages uh, than I can. Uh, so I've lost two to Denver, I've lost one to, uh, to Aurora PD, and uh, I've got uh, at least uh, two others that I'm aware of right now that may be leaving uh, next year. Uh, I've got some anticipated retirements. So I took uh, those attrition numbers, um, you know, of, uh, of what we've traditionally uh, built into that budget and, and uh, 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 added that, uh, you know, 12 positions uh, that I'm going to have to uh, hire next year to uh, replace or, or to add because we're asking for two additional police officer positions. And so if you take those 12 positions, you time it by $6,000, comes out to 72. So that, that, that's that increase that you're seeing there. Okay. Uh, it's part of what we've traditionally had in that budget plus the additional costs uh, to, to hire or actually to train 12 people. So. Yeah, so, and, and so I'm used to like zero-based budgeting that would list like all of this. What, you know, like, you know, again, I'll just go crash in traffic team. You know, actual budget for other services was uh, 1,487 proposed in, and then actual 2018 was 1,850 proposed 6,100. And I, I'm, you know, I, I think this is just an example but it's in every department and every other services, which it, it just adds up. So I think that's just my request as I look through all of these. You know, I could comb through and, and get Joey's money, um, you know, because it all, it adds up. It might be, you know, 5,000 here, 3,000 here, but it's hard to understand what it's going towards and how much of it could we be a little bit more, um, could we scrutinize more as, department heads and be a little tighter. So the, I, I know every year they say, Christy, these people know best, but um, as my job, I just hope everyone's scrutinizing this as best we can because the, I, I just know it's hard. We always want to get what we want, but sometimes mm -hmm. we have to maybe give up a little bit so that 
we can all do the best. Yeah. Well, Chrissy, you shouldn't, shouldn't apologize for scrutinizing the budget. That's your job. So, you know, no need to apologize for that. Um, I can tell you that we, we you know, it doesn't mean there's something that you still wouldn't want to cut. But I, I tell you, we, we do analyze every line item um, with the departments and, and we do variance budgeting where we look at, you know, you're, you, every year you ask for 10,000, but you only spend 2,000. Why do you need 10,000? So let's yeah. cut that back. And, you know, and I don't know if you want an answer on the, the crash and traffic team, but there, there's usually somewhat of an explanation for most of these. And that one, why they're only estimating to spend 1850 this year is because the crash and traffic team hasn't been staffed. And so they're not spending the money. Um, we're hoping that they're going to be fully staffed in 2019. So that's why there's 6,100 in there. And, you know, some, some of those those costs are uh, um, some of them are associated with uh, our motorcycle operators yeah. who will be training two new motorcycle operators. Uh, uh, we've had one of our motorcycle operators is uh, going to get uh, that's got, okay. You don't have to, to explain. It's just move you, know, corporal, but. you know you go through and you see them all, and they're no, all increased. I mean, I was happy to see. I want to give you know I'm going to send stickers around next week to anyone who was kind of flat. Ooh, yay! Thank you. So, anyways. Well, you look at the overall budget too, though, Christy, and I mean, you know, our, our, our well, I mean, our total, increase, our total increase is 1.5%, so, you know, there might be increase, bigger increases in some areas and, and decreases in other areas, so, you know, I like to look at the total budget if, you know, if we can keep that total increase down. Um, but, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Thank you, Ms. Hoppy. Thank you. Along the lines of um, staffing, I would like to say that I was extremely disappointed not to see a sustainability coordinator in 2019 proposed. Um, I do see that in the five-year plan, it's a half time is proposed for 2020, but um, I would like to see a half time in 2019, and I don't know if that's some that we could maybe do the horticulture assistant at half time and then have the sustainability heel coordinator at half time. Um, or if we could not do the horticulture assistant and um, hope that the seasonal um, uh, workforce would be better this year than it has been in years past. But I would really like us to consider that um, coordinator for 2019. Um, my other question is uh, for Scott, did you consider in um, your budget and your staffing snow removal for abandoned areas? Because when we had to first originally started with the snow um, uh, you know, code enforcement. We had looked at there's areas that are um, abandoned that um, we may have to pick up as a city. And so I'm just wondering if that is something that you're going to look at in 2019. Um, no, we did not specifically. Um, one of the things we wanted to come back to uh, council and discuss after we adopted the sidewalk ordinance was um, have we really identified some areas where, we, where we've had problems? Um, being the last two winters have been pretty mild, uh, we didn't get a lot of feedback on that yet, so that is something we'd like to discuss a little further with council, maybe at a later time, is, is do we, do we you know, want to have um, an identified program for hitting some of those areas? Great, thanks. And then um, kind of my last thing as far as staffing goes is, um, I guess I'm a little disappointed that our current PIO can't take care of some of our digital communications like Facebook and, and Twitter that would then free up the digital communications specialist to work on the website more. And so I'm just kind of wondering. She does, she does some of it, but uh, I was thinking about my explanation last time and I, I probably should have maybe explained a little bit more what Sarah currently does. And I mean, just right now she's, you know, she's working on a potential, um, she does a lot of the event planning for us too. So she's working on the 50th anniversary planning. She's working on a potential um, a G line opening um, station. She's done all of our, um, she does a lot of our ribbon cuttings with Steve and, and the Wheat Ridge Business Districts. Um, Chief, what, I mean, she works for you too. I mean, some of the things that she has to do for the police department. Um, it's, you, we really don't have, she does some of the, the social media stuff, but we, I really believe that this increase in the halftime digital communication specials is really to focus on the website. Again, I'm not, I'm not happy with our website. And it's not, we have missing links. Um, uh, there's the data is out of, the, the data gets out of date fairly quickly and it's because we don't have somebody that focuses on it. And 
and unless we don't um, get some more help, it's, it's going to be the way it is for a while. And then just from a PD perspective, uh, uh, Sarah's probably dealing with, uh, you know, three to, to six uh, media stories, you know, a week related to, you know, to crime uh, that occurs. Uh, our Facebook page is a very busy Facebook page, and uh, we get a lot of service requests. Uh, we get some complaints that come through uh, there. Uh, Sarah also monitors and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Wheat Ridge neighbors, there's, there's probably three to, to six other Wheat Ridge related sites that she monitors to see, you know, what's, what's mentioned about the city, what might be mentioned about the police department. And we've been really using her to, uh, to help us with, uh, with our police recruitment uh, uh, videos. Uh, we've done video, uh, we're doing safety videos every year, you know, uh, that target, uh, we did last year's was Halloween safety, the year before that was, uh, you know, school pedestrian safety. Uh, we try to use her to, to help us develop that storyline. Uh, in regards to that, we're doing another uh, recruitment uh, a video this year. Uh, you know, recruiting police officers has gotten very, very competitive. Uh, where I was getting 350 to 400 applications several years ago uh, for our current recruitment, we're at about 140. And of, of those, only 30 have, have actually submitted all of their paperwork to take the test. So if I have to hire eight police officers, I'm not going to get them out of, out of 30 applicants. We're trying to, uh, you know, to, to promote the city and, and what makes this city great and why people would want to come here and work. So uh, that's a lot of what she does, does for me. Uh, uh, she participates in uh, my management team, promotes some of the stories that comes out of that. So I keep her busy probably 50% of, of, of her day. Do, doing things for us and uh, 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 you know uh, I, I am surprised uh, to be honest with you at the impact of social media you know on the city and the PD it is it, it is a major chore you know Denver you know has has you know six PIOs you know that uh, that handle different different events in their city and their social media so we're just a microcosm of that really so I hope that helps thank you Thank you. Um, and then my last comment is just I support um, an additional twenty thousand dollars to the Carnation Festival, and forty-five to the Wheat Ridge Business District. Um, and, but I do realize that that's probably money that we'd have to find from somewhere else. Although we are at a nineteen percent, maybe that's where we find it very easily. But um, I just wanted to put out there that I support those. Thank you. I think Mr. Matthews I had next, and then Ms. Dozman. Pat Patrick, I can't find local works in the budget. It used to be under your uh, section, but I, I've not been able to find it anywhere. It's under, the, yeah, it's under the city manager's budget under the economic development division, um, 105. Um, if you look in the, the line item um, pages in line the back. 261. Yep, 261. Um, so a majority of, of their expenses um, are under line item 721, the NRS implementation. That's kind of a carryover, um, as I'm sure you remember, Wheat Ridge 2020, now Local Works was created out of the 2005 um, Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy. Is that 380 all of it, or is there stuff spread out somewhere else? No, that, that's a portion of it. Their, their total budget that they're um, proposing is, is um, 550500 for and 2000. how would we know that, and where 19. would we find it? Um, I provided you their, their budget in, in the front of your book, um, but that, that's a portion of it. Um, a portion is also under marketing and sponsorships. That's where the 40000 um, that goes to... Let's see. Sorry, I started reading at the back chapter and <laughs> found no, out how the fine. story ended. Um, yeah, it's, it's all, all of their money is spread out through the economic development budget. Um, but a chunk of it, most of it's in that one line item, 721. And I, I, can, I can tell you where the rest is if you'd like. So if I, if I could just kind of jump in, because um, some of my comments were kind of surrounding um, specifically the local works budget and where I kind of see some overlapping um, in other areas and where I feel like maybe we could save some money. Um, i first like to start off with, I was hoping to get more of a detailed budget as opposed to 
a regurgitation of what we've already seen in a study session. Um, I'm still really uncomfortable with $90,000 um, allocated to different to two different forms of communication, education, outreach, or engagement. Um, some sort of some sort of communications in addition to the $30,000 um, for the marketing materials. I, I think that a $30,000 to $50,000 jump for the community engagement and communications is a little much. Um, especially since we already have $40,000 allocated in 2018 for the communications, education, and outreach, which I don't really know the categorical difference in those. Um, did you get you had this in your book too? Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I did. Okay. Um, so I just, so they, they speak specifically to the community outreach and education about leadership capacity building in academies. So I know that there are some things like Pints and Policy um, and Partners in Progress that have kind of formed under the umbrella of Wheaties Academy, uh, but I know that we are not having a Wheaties Academy in 2019, um, that it will presume in 2020. Um, as a graduate of that program, I think that that is one that's very beneficial in engaging residents and creating leaders that um, are sustainable in the community. Uh, however, I just think that there's um, a lot of overlapping with other organizations and other programs. Um, so like the, for example, the $80,000 to the local works home and business loans, they've admitted that they're going to suspend the HIP program, which is the home portion of that program. Um, and they're going to continue on with the bubble program, which is the business loans, um, which is much like what the Wheat Ridge Business District already does in, in their organization. And we've, I would agree to give We Urge Business District um, more money, and I would like to see this $80,000 that was um, asked of us, that is up $30,000 from last year, um, be uh, de decreased. Either um, the $45,000 that we've allocated to the We Urge Business District, since they administer it through local works anyways, I don't understand why we have two of the same programs under two different organizations. Um, yeah, if you if you want to answer that. Uh, well, what I do know that there are two different um, programs. One is a grant program. The Weaverage Business District is a grant program. Um, we have different categories that we grant through, like um, facade and um, uh, signage, which is the kind of our most important one. Landscape. Landscaping, um, paint, which it's different than facade. ADA. So, ADA. And ADA compliance. So, but the building up business loan is a loan that a business can get that's not necessarily for like uh, exterior um, stuff. So, like it's a loan that they can get that has a low interest, and it's a five-year, it's a five-year loan, and then with a, like a bubble, a balloon payment at the end, and then it's got uh, I think it's like four percent interest. So the first year is no interest, the next couple of years are four percent interest. So they're they're two they do two different things so just so you know so if i'm reading off of the local works uh website their eligible project costs are exterior facade improvements sign repairs or replacement interior renovations small business equipment purchases new commercial building development and the projects must include exterior improvements visible from the street zero percent interest year one and four percent interest two years two to five so that's almost exactly what you just said the weird business district does Except the people pay it back and the Wee Ridge Business District give it as a grant. Okay. I guess. All right. Two I understand. So it's a, it's a loan versus a grant. So mm -hmm. versus a donation. Okay. Um, and then I also, so their line item, which I don't see reflected in our budget, um, is 83, the Ridge at 38 is $83,000. Um, and that's a line item separate from their $160,000 Ridge at 38 events. And they're also, it's also separate from their live local Wheat Ridge. So can you explain what, um, so I see like the banners and the, do, do they replace their banners each and every year? To the tune no. of $25,000? No. no, no, when, when they're needed, yeah, um, and, um, for different events. So, so. yeah, because I mean, we've allocated $25,000 yeah. for the last four years. Well, and first, first few years, those banners lasted about a day when the wind <laughs> came through and they got, they re-engineered them and I think they're, they're working finally. Um, and yeah, I, I, I can't say if they need to re they need that much every year to replace banners. I don't know if, you know, at this point it's, it's pretty consistent on what banners we have for most of our events. If somebody else from the community wants to put a banner up, they pay, they pay for it. 
but these are for Ridge Fest for the holiday celebration, the, the criterium, and, and yeah, yeah Holloway. Um, but yeah, so the, the eighty-three thousand you're mentioning, um, they that's a lump sum of of all these Ridge at thirty-eight plan implementations. So again, these are things that came out of um, the thirty-eighth Avenue plan to market thirty-eighth Avenue, the banners, leadership committee, marketing materials, and and their their website. Um, and it's explained a little bit more in their memo here. So it's a, the Ridge at 38 plan implementation. So that's yes. the total $83,000. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, so my last big hoopla with this budget is the 22,500 allocated to marketing and positioning tours. Um, in their explanation, they say that it's the mid-century and modern tour, welcome to Wheat Ridge tour and explore Wheat Ridge tour. Um, none of which have been planned or have happened in the year 2018. Um, so I don't know, they estimate $10,000 out of that, um, estimated 10,000 out of the 20,000 um, that was asked of last year. And I've looked at their calendar and the mid-century modern tour is not on the calendar. They have not had either of the bus tours. Okay, so, so do, we, do we not need to give that to them every year? Because I don't understand why they're asking for twenty-two thousand five hundred. Um, is that just because they're planning on doing it next year? As opposed, no, they wrote they rotate every year. They do a different type of tour. Um, so yeah, one one year they do the mid-century modern tour. The next the next they do these, the garden tour. Um, the garden tour is uh, they didn't list it on here, but that's one of the tours I think that comes out of this. So they rotate those, but then they also do the Wheat Ridge the Explore Wheat Ridge Tour for new residents and the uh, Welcome to Wheat Ridge Tour, I think, for, for realtors and businesses. I don't, I don't remember that being... I don't know if they did anything this year or not, and it might have been because of the staffing. Um, I can't answer that question if they did them or not. I don't, don't know. Jenny, do you know? You're not on the board, are you? I'm pretty sure they did the Welcome to Wheat Ridge Tour. I, yeah. I'm not sure if they did the real tour tour this last year. So I attended the last Welcome to Wheat Ridge, and it was last year, September of last year, 2017. Well, and, and you see they're only estimating to spend 10000 this year? This year, yeah. So um, so obviously they're not doing them all um, So this I was going to ask if you know what that was allocated towards this year. I don't. Since none of them are on the calendar. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell you right now. I don't know. I can find out. All right. So I just, I think that a lot of the programs, especially the increase in, um, the proposed budget or the proposed ask of local works is kind of overlapping and I think that if we kind of tighten their budget up a little bit, um, especially when it comes to community um, communications and engagement, uh, as well as maybe some of the banners and uh, events themselves, uh, I think that we can allocate some more money elsewhere. Um, I was also going to see if you know the cost of the overtime staffing for Ridge at 38 events? For, for Wheat Ridge staff? City of Wheat Ridge staff? Yeah, I mean, because like, it's, it's, it's outlined for the Carnation Festival, and I just didn't know if... Yeah, we don't. Carnation Festival is, is the biggest expense. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, Ridge Fest, the Ridge Fest, I don't, I don't believe it's, it's, we have any overtime. It's just staff that's on, on, on site, on site or on, that's working that weekend. You, do you have some overtime? Okay. Police Department has a little bit of overtime. It's not nearly as much as, as the Carnation Festival. Um, parks is very minimal too, and Public Works is very minimal. Carnation Festival is a huge impact, so it's just absorbed in our, our general fund overtime budgets. I, so don't I, I just, I just want to make a comment about some things that have kind of been mentioned uh, at the Carnation Festival board meetings here and there, and that I think that it would be wise for us as a council or prudent for the city to consider. Um, one of the biggest costs to any kind of event planning is our facilities. Um, and a lot of that is the tents that we rent each and every year. Um, I think it would be beneficial for the city to uh, purchase, to own tents that would be able to be used at the Ridge at 38 events as well as the Carnation Festival. Um, it would be awesome if it was uh, labeled with the city logo um, and kind of just give us a little bit more ownership of that. We would maybe incur some more costs at setup and teardown, but I'd much prefer to pay our staff to do that than continually have to seek out good facilities um, organizations to incur those costs. Uh, I know that facilities is a really big issue as far as we um, see in event planning, and that's 
one of the biggest costs for the Carnation Festival, and I'm assuming that it's probably a pretty major cost for local works as well. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. <clears throat> Just a couple of items. One is uh, to, to talk about something you mentioned. Uh, I asked the Housing Authority if they wanted me to ask for money to replace the housing loan program that, that, lo that uh, Local Works uh, gave up, and I got no support. I'm, I'm grinding my teeth when I say this, but I got no support from them. Uh, now something else. <coughs> I really do think that we turned the Environmental Sustainability Committee into orphans. They, they put in a lot of time, they worked really hard, they were great people, and their suggestions are valuable suggestions. And I think we would be remiss if we did not um, follow up on some of their suggestions. So I would like to ask for consensus that we um, give them the phase two budget plus $7,500, which would go to support for the, um, for homes, for the uh, Excel Home Energy Squad evaluations. Uh, that would be just a supplement to uh, what Excel charges. Excel charges $75. Um, if we paid, uh, let's say $35 of that, uh, and hopefully get Excel to bill it, we could uh, maybe encourage some of our folks to um, utilize that service. So what I'm asking for is $25,500. Can I have a consensus for that? Can we have some discussion on it first? Um, yeah, we could have a little discussion. Mr. Matthews? Thank you. I'm totally against giving any money out to the Sustainability Committee this year. Um, I expressed some of those opinions earlier. Uh, there's a lot of issues that are going on in, in our uh, state right now with sustainability, and it all gets back to some other issues. One is um, public service itself. I mean, we've been told we have to have a lot of respect for public circus. I don't think so. Pardon me, that's Excel. Public Circus is an old holdover from public service from when I was in construction. Uh, let me just read a, a, a piece here about public or Excel. On the issue of waste in the investment by retiring raw high power plants unit one early. In a previous column, I stated it would cost one billion to one and a half billion to replace the coal unit at Rawhide. I was a little off. Utility experts tell me it would only cost one billion to one point two five billion. I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks or maybe a month or two ago that um, public service Excel had this plan to close some coal-fired plants early. They have two perfectly good coal-fired plants that were some of the cleanest units in the country and they want to retire them early and waste that money so that they can go to renewables. Even the PUC said that by monetary common sense standards, it made no sense. But the PUC covered it by saying, oh, but there's some intrinsic value. This is all part of what, we're, what we see when we get into this green sustainable issue. Um, as a for instance, um, they want $4,000 here to promote waste reduction among residents. Well, hopefully we can do that without having to pay uh, for a program to uh, promote waste reduction among residents. I mean, I would hope that many of our residents are already savvy enough to figure if they can save some dollars by doing <coughs> waste reduction, they will do that on their own. Um, they want to want to uh, have $4,000 here, and what a, part of what they want to do is monitor water quality in Clear Creek. I'll bet you there's already five state and federal agencies that monitor water quality in our creek, in Clear Creek. Um, create a green business promotional program, $2,000. I don't think that's what we need to do as a city right now. One of our speakers today mentioned about how Denver has their green program and green roofs. 
And she forgot to mention that Denver is also backing off on that program because it's not working. And they ran into so many problems, they've had to take giant steps backwards with it. I just don't see that we need to have the birth of another bureaucracy in this city, and that's exactly what it's going to be. It's just another bureaucracy, just like 2020, that it started out, was supposed to be self-sustainable in a short amount of time, and we're still paying them a half a million dollars a year. Okay. Um, that's my opinion on it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pond? Just a clarification. Um, I think we had brought this up last time we talked about it. I don't, I, I agree with the 25,000. I agree with it as a budget, a budget amount um, to pursue the recommendations that were um, offered up by this, by this committee. Um, I think we already discussed the fact that it, that it probably isn't set up right now or shouldn't be handing $25,000 to a committee necessarily, but for us to budget it and as a council, for us to be able to take um, the recommendations from that committee, hopefully keep them engaged and in panel, but allow, allow us then to put the money forward in the best way possible. And I think that answers a lot of the questions about obviously not being redundant and not pushing that money to things that don't make sense. And for us to have, um, to be engaged with it all, all along, I, um, I think that we should. So I, uh, if, if Mr. Fitzgerald would, would agree to that, essentially, that slight modification of the consensus. Um, I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. That would be, that would be where I would, I, I would support. And I, I would like to go uh, and, and let you know that I've agreed uh, with the Environmental Sustainability Committee. They were set up as a mayor's uh, task force or committee, if you will, and I've agreed to, to go ahead for 2019 and continue them under the auspices of the mayor. So I'm, I'm uh, ready, willing, and able to, to uh, act as an umbrella for that. Ms. Duran. Thank you. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that um, I support this and I supported this from the beginning. I think we need to be mindful of what we're all doing in our community. We are behind Arvada, Lakewood, uh, Denver, Golden. And um, I think that they were really modest in what they were asking for. I think 25,500 um, to include that in the budget. We're having a say oversight. Um, we're participating in this, but we also asked them to come back with a tier and they came back with a tier phase two and put in a lot of time and effort and I want to see this move forward a little disappointed that we didn't go with a coordinator who could help facilitate some of these things and help the committee so I hope we can look at maybe doing that um, in the future because I think it's important to do thank you very much mr. urban thank you mr. mayor at the outset I'd just like to thank all the committee members once more uh, for their time and commitment and volunteering to put all this together. Uh, that being said, um, to suggest that we're going to spend money on environmental sustainability to then issue biannual mailers or other uh, paper materials out to the citizens to tell them how and, and what to do with respect to environmental sustainability is uh, laughable because uh, if we're going to be uh, preaching, we need to be uh, walking the walk as a city, as a city government. and so. When we start talking about uh, rain, uh, city subsidized grants to provide rain barrels, the city government should have rain barrels established on every one of their properties prior to telling the residents that they should install them on, on their properties. Uh, back when I was uh, a young Boy Scout, I received the Environmental uh, Science Merit Badge, and one of the requirements of that was to identify 10 ways in, in our home that we could reduce, reuse, or recycle, and then practice those uh, for a seven-day period. In, in this recommendations, there's very little that's required of the city government to do with respect to uh, practicing our, what we're preaching, and that's what I'm most concerned about with respect to this budget, is we're spending the majority on this, of this budget going out and telling everybody else what to do, but with respect to what the city is doing and what our departments are doing on an individual department level, it's really you know, focused outward versus focused inward. And if we were to spend the, the first step in, an, in encouraging environmental sustainability in our city on what our city staff can do and what our city government can do, that I think would go a lot further than issuing uh, postcards like this out to citizens. And what they're gonna do is throw it in the trash. That just makes no sense to me. So I, I would encourage us to 
uh, rework this to only focus on those steps that the city itself can do to become more environmentally friendly, more environmentally sustainable, and then we can use those examples to educate our citizens on uh, how they can do that themselves. But I, I wouldn't uh, want to support something that is counter to environmental sustainability, and, and that's what's being proposed here. Thank you very much. Ms. Dozman? So I, would, I would echo those thoughts. Um, number six in our uh, SMART goals is Wheat Ridge is committed to environmental stewardship. Um, but it's to create a sustainability committee to set priorities for the city. And I would really like for some of those priorities to create a culture within our departments. I, I wouldn't mind having those be instilled in our values in the bureaucracies that are already existing. But I have a really hard time with maintaining um, a special committee that isn't um, appointed and approved by the city council. And um, it, we're giving $18,000 and now would you ask for 25,500 um, in order to implement some of these some of these goals that I feel we could implement into the existing departments and organizations that we already have as opposed to creating a whole nother bureaucracy um, that is a special committee with funds behind them I really like the pie program idea um, for the Excel partners in energy I think that that would be wonderful and I think that evaluating um, as a city. I know that when we were doing the Anderson Park renovation project, it did come up um, about ways in which the, the Anderson building could be more sustainable. And I know that that takes money, but I think that like Mr. Urban has said, it's really difficult for us to impose regulations and impose um, any, any kind of values it, to our public when we are not be, we are not living those ourselves as a government agency. Well, just to remind council, we we are living some of those. Um, we 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 do have a plan that we put together um, over the last several years, and maybe some new council. You may, maybe you haven't had the fortune to see the presentation, but Joyce Manwaring um, led that charge, and, and we've had a, a staff of we had a committee of staff members from every department that looked at and, and provided recommendations on what the city government could do to um, address sustainability issues. And, and we have a whole plan that's put together. It's on the city's website. It was, present, it was presented to this committee. Um, we, we didn't have the capacity as city employees to take it further, to take it to a community sustainability plan, which is why um, Joyce Jay um, um, put together that last committee. And the mayor is suggesting that we continue with. Um, you know, there's, Joyce could speak to it if you want, but there's many recommendations on, uh, we have idling policies for our, our vehicles, um, recycling policies, um, we've, we've done energy audits on all of our buildings, so we have done a lot in-house. Um, are, are we doing enough? Probably not, but um, we, there is a plan in place and we've done quite a bit. Uh, Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to address this to the committee itself. Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, it's kind of a hot button for me. And so I appreciate the work that you've done, but in my mind, this committee was established as an advisory committee to assist the council and the city in accomplishing some goals. And here we are, you came back and asked for $18,000 to do some things, which isn't advisory anymore, but we haven't even established that we're gonna put that in the budget yet, and already we have suggestions to raise that to more money. And that is where I really become upset when we kind of throw caution to the wind and, and chase some rainbows a little bit. I appreciate the effort that everyone put into that work, but it's my position that it's an advisory committee, it was created that way and that's what we need to keep in mind when it comes to budget issues. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Ms. Hoppy. Keeping in mind that this is not monies that will be spent unless the, um, unless the work is done and that um, it's more like a, a marker in our budget to say we have this and it, we won't have to come back and ask for it later. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Fitzgerald to ask for his consensus again. I renew my request for consensus. Okay, the consensus is on the table. We've had the discussion. It's time to uh, raise your hands or not. One, two, three, four, five. We have consensus to, to uh, put $25,500 into the budget to, uh, to get the sustainability committee kicked off. 
let's let's give them an opportunity to uh, to have some funding and see what they can do besides advisory work to see what kind of uh, what kind of results they can bring to the city because we need to have something going on, Miss Davis. And again, it's our understanding that those projects would still come to the council. Uh, that that's a great like, idea, certainly. Like I, for you know, instance, I, I I think we need to have buy-in for what we're doing, and I think I think right. these I think these committee members will put together viable viable programs and viable costs to have it done. Mr. Matthews, I, qu I have a question. Um, generally, when you want to have a budget item and add to the budget, you have to figure out where the money's coming from and get a line item. Have we thought of that yet? Where's the money coming from, and what line item is it going to be? Ms. Hoppy. Well, we are uh, currently at 19 uh, percent. We can take it down to 17 percent, and then um, I'm sure that there will be some requests for taking some money out of places. I have one that I'll be asking later. Okay. Right now, we've been at this for a little over two and a half hours. Um, if we're going to continue along this line, we're going to need to take a 10-minute break. So we're going to recess for 10 minutes. Thank you.
And Mr. Pond. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to kind of bring back um, some general comments and, and perhaps hit a couple of the specific things that have been raised previously. First, let uh, thank everyone who's put time into the budget. It's, it's a lot of work and it's a heavy book and there's a lot of detail and I appreciate it always and I know we, we end up, um, you know, really getting in, engaged with it, um, which I think is good and, and the point, but, and it's uh, obviously a testament to the amount of work and passion and care that's been put into it um, on the staff side and certainly, uh, you know, that's, and we're also equally passionate about it. I'm gonna just broadly say a couple things um, and, then, and then try to make a, um, some suggestions on some of the things that have been discussed. I think one of the one of the greatest um, kind of messages inside of this budget is is the elevation of our city. I mean that we are seeing a whole bunch of things occurring inside of this budget, increased revenues, yes, increased expenses, um, but things like you know millions of dollars of bond and 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 you know investment into our community. So we ought to be pausing for a second and celebrating. Um, th that at a general level, because it's, a, it's, it's, you know, we have sat here and hoped for this day, I think, um, to be able to talk about, you know, the, you know, these type of dollars and this type of investment in our city. At that, at the, you know, staying at that for a minute, I would say that um, there's been a couple discussions about, about the FTEs that are, that are um, uh, as one item that have been represented in this budget. Um, I, I support it as, it, as it's stated, I, I think we could, and you know, I also support ideas like the sustainability um, position as well, but I would, I would pause and say that, I, like, first I wanna, I wanna stop where we're at from a staff recommendation and, and, and support that inside of a balanced budget and, and say that, again, it goes to the, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the, the justification for it, it's about, the level that we've raised our community to, either by putting in new services, literally annexing places that didn't exist and put them online, or parks that didn't exist and putting them online, and services that our citizens have become, you know, come to expect. And I do believe that it's important for us to stay on top of the curve, and I know that we have been behind it at times. And as painful as it is to see an increase in, in a budget, it's, I believe, more painful to sit here and realize that we're behind the curve on especially services that people, our neighbors are, that we represent are expecting or demanding in our, in our community. I see this as a fair response to that. And so at least, you know, to just to kind of put that one point down, I, th I, I support the FTEs that are, that are um, considered here. I support the trajectory moving forward. Um, and if we can get to a place where we can look at the sustainability, um, um, you know, coordinator, I would I would support that as well. But I don't want to pull back from what's been represented inside of here. It's been mentioned, and I'll just kind of put real numbers to it that this budget is reflect is a balanced budget, but it reflects having reserves, prudent reserves of 6.8 million dollars, which is 19.4 percent, and our recommended prudent reserve level is 17 percent. That's a difference of 800 thousand dollars. So this is a balanced budget that actually has in it 800 thousand dollars of room for us to work if we want to take it. I see no reason why we wouldn't take it. Our published prudent reserve is 17%. We've said that and we've talked about it before. We've never talked about raising it. If anything, we've talked about lowering it. So 17 is not a, uh, is not a number that we have not um, debated and cared about and thought about. Inside of that, or uh, apart from that, are several hundred thousand dollars that are not in inserted into this budget. Patrick went over them. $500,000 for bond, you know, for, for uh, you know, debt reimbursement that was likely to happen in, ni in 19. If, and if it doesn't, I would assume it was going to happen immediately in 20. But that's a half million dollars that's out there. And three hundred to five hundred or $600,000 of tax revenues that are anticipated when these projects come online, but again, are not reflected in revenues in this budget. So if you look at that, there's probably a million and a half, 
you know, um, all, all told, but 800,000 for sure, because we, we have the option right now to say no, hold the, hold the reserve at a lesser amount than 19.4, than, than because our published rate is 17. And we know that there's uh, some, some buffer and some, pre, you know, some, some conservatism in this revenue projection that's accounting for several other 100,000. So in summary, I, I support the balanced budget that's being presented. I support the, the content with, that, that's in it. Um, like I supported the, the 25,000 for the sustainability, I would support the 20 for, for Carnation Festival. I would support the, the 45 for the Wheat Ridge Business District. Um, I know there's some discussions of other trims and that's fine, but the truth is is that I think we, that we have it, we, we have it within, within this, within this budget, large macro level budget profile to, to take, to bring in and, and be responsive to some of the requests that came to us through this budget process, including tonight. Um, uh, and yes, we can be, we can manage um, some of these other things, but the truth is, is that we have an opportunity within this budget to actually um, maintain a, a, an, an aggressive investment in our community that meets the aggressive growth and development that's going on, and I think that we should do that. So I know there's going to be some other um, discussions that go on, but I would encourage us to, to, to at some point here um, call the question, um, reduce our um, reduce the reserves to a level that that meets the the um, the request for some of these other monies to come into our budget, and uh, and move forward. Thank you. Well, let's move forward with an eye to um, to sort of making making good decisions and making them in a in a reasonable time fashion. Miss Davis. Okay, so I hope this is just a quick one. I won't drag on. Um, so I was I was going to ask the council, and this is just a small reduction, but I think a reasonable one, um, still supporting the vision and um, goals of our citizen review committee. But, um, and I know they were a bit over budget from where they were in 2018, but they have the action center that they gave 3,000, but as a council, we gave the action center 20,000. So I'm just wondering if that's something that um, we would consider possibly just giving the action center the 20,000 and, and taking that off of the citizen review committee uh, list because we're giving them as a council, we gave them 20,000. Ms. Hoppy? I guess I would say that that was two different asks. And so um, one of them was like the one time ask. And um, we, have, we have the money for the $3,000 and we know that they're in a, a place, a really, a really difficult place. And so I wouldn't necessarily want to take that money away from them. Uh, Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I'm, I just feel that maybe we might be setting a bad precedent in having our outside agency committee uh, allocate money to certain organizations. And I know they spend a lot of time scrutinizing the asks of that money and then have an organization um, be awarded that money, but then turn around and ask the city council of an even larger amount of money that we awarded and maybe the outside agency committee, had they known that information, would have allocated that $3,000 elsewhere to maybe an organization within Wheat Ridge. So that's my biggest concern with that. Ms. Duran? The 20,000 was allocated for what exactly? That was sort of a, a one-time, they're hurting right now. So that was sort of a one-time ask, it was, um, the, uh, the, the county put a challenge out there so they would match us dollar for dollar on that so it had a, it had a better earning power. Uh, so that's different than the annual and I believe we fund the Action Center on an annual basis with our community grant giving. So that was a, that was a distinct one-time one -time occurrence. Separate from the 3,000? Separate from the 3,000. From the outside agency, yes, thank you. All right, so. Okay, so, uh, you know. All right. Okay. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, 38th Avenue and 44th Avenue. Um, it appears as though we're spending about uh, $1,173,000 $1, on various 
38th Avenue related uh, expenses, whether it be uh, the events on 38th, the rigid 38th, the implementation plan, the plan implementation. And so um, if you look at the uh, 2017 uh, sales tax figures, that expense of 1.1 million is roughly 61% of the sales tax revenues from 30th Avenue. And then as you look at uh, 44th, we're, we're spending less than 7% of that sales tax on 44th as you look at the uh, the income and sales tax from 44th. And so uh, I guess uh, as we look at this, obviously I have some concerns about the spending of $160,000 on rigid 38th events, but that's not really the biggest uh, piece of the pie here. The biggest piece is the $900,000 for the uh, green. And I don't think anything's changed here. We're not owning that land, correct? We're not purchasing that land. We haven't had final discussions with the school district on that. They're, they're interested in still moving forward, but um, the last time we spoke to them, they, they, weren't, they wanted to maintain ownership. Okay, so um, I, you know, I just don't see the, um, the, the benefit and the uh, reasoning behind fixing up someone else's property without any kind of equal remuneration from the school district uh, to that effect. If the school district wanted to go halves on us uh, to uh, help develop that, that would be a different discussion. But as it stands, spending $900,000 to fix up the green when, when we look at the economic vitality of 38th, it's uh, doing very well in certain areas and could do better in other areas. But the fact is, is that 44th is doing even better without uh, th this continual uh, dump of cash onto 38th. And so I would like us to consider uh, moving some of the monies that we're putting in 38th onto 44th and see how we can benefit 44th uh, even more so than it than it has in the past because it, it does feel like the redheaded stepchild and that it doesn't get the love that 38th does, at, but yet it outperforms as, as it relates to the sales tax increase that we see on 44th. So I just don't see why we're spending uh, the amount of money that we are on 38th uh, because it, we're not seeing that rate of return. So I would ask us to reconsider the at least the green project, if not some of these other elements on 38th. Uh, Ms. Dozman. Uh, I would agree with those statements. I think that um, a lot of the residents feel on 44th Avenue or in that, in that vicinity and in those neighborhoods feel like they've kind of been left out of this redevelopment and revitalization programs that we've implemented throughout the city. Uh, 38th Avenue gets hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. Um, you know, we see the, this rigid 38. Uh, most of the local works budget is completely um, allocated towards 38th Avenue, and we've given them a lot of money over the years to market that rigid 38 and host those events on 38th Avenue. Um, and I know that we have, like, the Shop 44th, and we also have the 29th Avenue uh, business district or kind of marketplace market, marketplace yes thank you um, and I just feel as if those kind of get neglected while we continue to bolster and pour money into 38th Avenue um, I definitely think that we can kind of share the love in that respect um, I also do have a lot of concerns with the green um, the nine hundred thousand dollars for some reason I read that at ninety thousand dollars and I was thought we were getting a heck of a deal, and then I'd go back and no, um, especially if we are not maintaining any sort of ownership. Um, I would hate to see us spend $900,000 on a property that we do not own, um, and that we do not, do we have a first right of refusal in that? Again, we, ha we haven't had those final negotiations with the school district. Um, you know, things may have changed. Um, there's new new administration. Um, I think that I don't know, Joyce, you had the most recent conversations with Tim Reed. Did he give any comments on that portion? No. No, I would just say that you know, we have examples where we have invested in parks on school district properties and we do an IGA intergovernmental agreement with them so that we can provide uh, services to our citizens. For example, the baseball fields behind that school are that property is owned by the school district, but the city invested in it to put the lights and fields in, and then we maintain them. So we have some different kinds of arrangements uh, for joint use of, of land. I think the way, to, you know, the way to look at the green is really another type of, of uh, park or gathering place for our community. And I mean, we, you know, 
we, we've, got a, we've got still, I believe, a vision out there to where 38th Avenue is a main street in the city that where a lot of activity happens. And I, you know, I'm a business owner on 29th Avenue and I, hear, I certainly understand implicitly the, the, the debate about the, you know, the, the other numbered streets or the other, you know, Youngfield or, or other streets that happen and have commercial, commercial corridors. But I think you need to, to sort of look at some of the, vision, the visioning that we've done, Mr. Ann. I was just going to say, if we're going to spread some of that over to 44th, we should on 29th. Some sidewalks or bike lanes would be nice down 29th Avenue. Ms. Hoppy. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, the first time we had those conversations with the um, school about improving the green, um, they had discussed that um, if they were to sell that property, we would get a first right of refusal on it, um, and that um, there was a, an agreement in, like, the ability to use it and when and whatnot times and all of that stuff there was an agreement but um, you know kind of like uh, Bud said it's creating the the kind of the town center and that green is kind of is the only green space on on 30th Avenue in that main area and so it really has become the the gathering spot um, as far as the sales tax revenue reports I just need to ask Zach were you referring to the ones that we got from the treasurer because if that's the case the 44th Avenue was shared into Youngfield and the 38th Avenue was only shared into Wadsworth and so they're not super apples to apples because they're not the entire street on those reports mm -hmm. and so um, so that would skew the numbers a little bit on that and um, so I just I, I support putting some investment into that green and kind of moving that vision down the road finally. Mr. Matthews and then Mr. I would just remind the councilwoman that those were based on percentages. So it, whether it's this long or that long, 44th increased by 58%, we're not talking dollars. So that whole area increased by 58%, whereas 38th Avenue has not. That takes away a little bit of that skewing um, concept. Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just getting back to the redevelopment of the green, um, in, in the event that it is still a school and it's owned by the district, I would be worried about us as a city creating inequity and kind of bridging that division that we have already had between our elementary schools. Like we do student-based budgeting, so we literally compete for students for money per the district. and investing $900,000 into one school in our community versus all of the rest, I would have a really difficult time supporting that. I know that it's a gathering place. I know that it's a hub for the 38th Avenue events, but that really is putting $900,000, so close to a million dollars into one school in our community. And I would really, really be hesitant to do that. Mr. Fitzgerald. I'd like to, uh echo what Ms. Hoppy said, this, uh, the green is intended to be the center gathering, gathering space for the city of Wheat Ridge. And the, the fact is, it already is. All of our events are there, our Christmas tree lighting is there, our Ridge at 38th is there, the criteria is there. It is already our center, central gathering place. Um, so I, I think, as in my memory is, we had a signed agreement with the school district under a previous administration. We, we have a signed MOU, um, which allows us to part to use the space for our current um, events and other other pro, um, events. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine the school uh, district. Uh, doing something negative to that space because they're going to get something out of this too. They're going to get an amphitheater out of it. So this is really for us. It's not for them, although they, they also benefit. I think uh, I, I wanted, you raise an interesting, an interesting issue about the equity amongst the schools in, the, in, in, this, uh, in the city and our participation with that. I would, I would sort of argue that, um, the, the development that we did at the Ridge at 38 did not, really was not a pro-school benefit. 
I think it's, it's really not like we're making an investment in the school itself or in the facilities at the school. It's actually sort of really a city benefit, but go ahead. And, and yeah, but we are investing in one school's property and we are allocating a whole lot of money in order to revitalize their space. And that's a matter of, you know, really spotlighting and highlighting their school if we're having events, I mean, primarily on 38th Avenue. Uh, we have performances in the park and then we have the Carnation Festival uh, off 44th Avenue in Anderson Park, but other than that, the majority of the events are, are at 38th Avenue, and I would and I would venture to argue that one of the biggest ben benefactors of those programs, and especially if we allocate $900,000 into um, creating this wonderful space for one school in particular, would be Stevens Elementary. I, you know, you never heard you never hear going to the green to Stevens Elementary. You know, that's all I'll say is it's it's. It's at the green, it's never at Stevens. But. To do it for the budget? You got another budget question, Mr. Urban. Thank you, this question may be for Joyce. Uh, in the uh, parks budget, or at least the rec center budget, indicates that the marketing line item has been zeroed out. Uh, has that been transferred to some place else, or what's the strategy there? Uh, the marketing budget uh, in the past has been split between the general fund and the recreation center fund. And based on our <clears throat> marketing program, being for the entire department, that, that budget was moved to the general fund budget in its entirety. 100% marketing is now in the general fund budget under recreation administration. Okay. Um. And so more broadly, I guess, for Patrick, as it relates to these efforts around communication, marketing, outreach, it seems like we have a lot of silos within the city relative to those activities. And I'd be, I haven't been able to, to cut, get a number to it, but it seems like we have a variety of different uh, individuals or roles that uh, try to accomplish the same thing. Is there anything we can do to consolidate those efforts? And I understand we're looking to increase the FTE for the digital communications specialist, but uh, with the local works budget and uh, the, now the environmental sustainability budget, it appears as though we have this going on in a variety of different places. I'd like to see how we can consolidate that. Um, well, I, I think they're all working on um, distinct um, uh, projects in um, marketing. Um, the Joyce's position in the marketing um, is marketing um, parks and rec events. Um, yeah, could the city PIO do that? I, I guess you could. Um, but um, again, the city's by PIO is, is working on police and more general community events. Um, sustainability committee, I guess if you give them that money, you know, they're, they're talking about sustainability um, projects. Um, I, I believe all, all the projects are distinct and unique to, to who's working on them. But if you had suggestions, um, we, we take those. But I, I think they're, they're pretty unique and, and separate. Well, I guess, you know, the, just a, one specific issue is uh, with respect to the environmental sustainability budget is that they're looking for uh, money to do branding and logo design and, and whatnot and we had the same thing for the uh, the 2e projects where we did branding and, and logo design for that and I don't know that the city <coughs> needs to be spending any more money on developing brands and logos and names for what we're already doing but if we had a consolidated effort around marketing communications uh, and outreach uh, that sort of um, uh, siloing wouldn't happen as much because un under a traditional uh, corporate structure, you wouldn't have 20 different logos. You would have one logo. And so that's what I'm concerned about is this continual, you know, birthing of new brands and new logos. There, is there a style guide for the city relative to how these are to be developed? Sure, we have a style, we have style guide for the city's logo. Um, again, that's a unique logo for the city's organization. The rec center has um, a new um, brand. Um, the rec center acts as a separate business from the, the city's government, which is part of their marketing effort. Um, and, you know, different events have diff different um, audiences and, and, and different marketing efforts. Um, you know, we get, we get a lot of criticism for not being transparent enough and not talking enough about what we're doing. So a lot of these efforts are, are helping with that, in my right. mind. And I don't want to discourage yeah. us from being transparent or, or talking or bragging about what we're able to accomplish and 
success, being successful, but it just seems like we have uh, the, the same function happening across multiple departments and within multiple organizations. And it, it, if, it, if only those people were to at least talk to one another or coordinate with one another as it relates to printing costs or what, what have you, uh, that's where I think we're missing the boat. Mr. Ann. Thank you. Um, I see in here that we have the retail marijuana fees, but not our tax revenue. Patrick, do you know what that is for 2018? We're estimating about 750,000 total um, this year. Um, the, the fees that you see that are line item out are the fees that we get from the state. We get a portion of the fees they, they, they um, generate. Um, and then the local sales tax that are generated off our retail stores are just in our sales tax um, total line item. But okay. we, we, keep, we track that separately, and I think we're estimating about 750000 this year. So that's rolled right over to our general fund, correct? Yes, it's all in the general fund. Okay, and have we estimated if we extend our hours from 7 to 10, what we would be bringing in? I believe I heard a comment from somebody at the last presentation that the industry believes 20%. I think maybe, Tim, you mentioned that comment. Yeah, I, I don't have those figures with me, but I do have them. And uh, we're going to, you know, that's on the agenda, I think, for next week. Oh, okay. And uh, I will all bring those figures because uh, I do have the figures. That'd be great. Or if you could just email them over, that would be nice. Yeah, that would be good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dozeman. Sorry, I have one comment and then a question. So one of the uh, speakers tonight mentioned a community solar garden, which uh, we do have in the budget. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to make that known. And then Patrick, I see on the local works budget that they uh, were pre uh, presented $10,000 um, last year for planning for the 2019 50th anniversary events uh, gala. And they also asked for an additional $10,000 uh, for next year. Can you tell me what they spent last year's $10,000 or this year's $10,000 on and what they or you propose that they plan or pay for with that other $10,000? So, Was it in their memo? Well, it says for the for the gala. Well, that's all it says. The detail, yeah. though, I was wondering. Yeah. I, do, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I, you know, honestly, it's probably to pay for their staff time to participate in the um, planning efforts. Um, I don't think there was any hard cost at this point, um, but they, they are participating in the, the, the planning committee, so it's probably to cut their staff time. Okay. Um, and so is the $60,000 allocated in the city's budget, um, including this event, or... Um, is the, this $10,000 wrapped up in that 60000 or is it separate? It's separate. Okay. So we're proposing $70,000 specifically to 50th anniversary planning throughout the 2019 school, or school year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that parent hat <laughs> sometimes comes out. So uh, 2019 fiscal year? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pond. I'm going to come back to something I said and just try to uh, um, offer up a consensus on, a, on a, a general topic with a few subsets. Uh, I've, we've already um, have consensus on a $25,500 commitment to the uh, Environmental Sustainability um, Committee um, recommendations. I have heard, and I just, if we can just, I can get someone to nod in confirmation, $20,000 um, that is being requested by the Carnation Festival, um, and $45,000 re requested by the Wheat Ridge Business District. So for, for, for $90,500, I would ask for consensus to, to, to go ahead and, and uh, 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 approve those things within, uh, with the associated um, Reduction of our of our um, uh, re reserve funds, bringing bringing us a little bit closer to 17. That doesn't get us anywhere near. That's just that's just a uh, hundred thousand dollars of the 800. But um, but at least doing that and and taking those pieces of work. Okay, that looks like a consensus. Can, can I clarify that? I just want to make sure I got it right. You said 27 for car additional 27 for Carnation Festival and an additional 45,000 to. 20 for Carnation. Oh, what, I'm sorry, what did I say? You said 27. Uh, okay. Is that how this works? Consensus, yeah. 
Can I, an additional 20,000 to the Carnation Festival and an additional 45,000 to Wheatridge businesses. Is that what on you top said? Of, and, and then we already had consensus on the 25.5. Yes, I got but, that. But there was a question as to how we were how we were accounting for that and, and what we just agreed to is that it's, we're taking okay. our 19.4% down by 90,500 okay. against that. Okay. So I would like to make a motion to reduce local works budget um, by $85,500, bringing the total to 465000 for their 2019 fiscal year. Cons Did you consensus. say those numbers Sorry, again? A consensus. Yeah, so I'm, I would like to make a consensus to um, decrease the local works budget by 85500 bringing the total to 465000 for next year, 2019. That's less than what they spent in 2018. So that's based on the, the reductions that we discussed. So we, so we um, propose to reduce the business and home loans program from 80,000 to 50,000. We proposed to decrease the communications ed education outreach from 40,000 to 30,000. The marketing and positioning tours from 22,500 to 15,000. And the community engagement and communications from 50,000 to 30,000. What, 50 to 30? 50,000 to 30,000, 30. yes. And then the Ridge at 38 events from 160,000 to 150,000. And then the 38th Avenue Leadership Committee uh, from 18,000 to 10,000. Leah, I disagree with your um, communication engagement from 50 to 30. I would like to see it at least be at 40. So we had discussed that because they spent 30 in 2018 um, and that they had marketing materials, digital media support, banners and lights, as well as the communications education outreach that we would reduce that to the 2018 estimated cost of 30,000. And we also discussed that the new director also talked about her ability for fund grants and the her, her fundraising that that was she was going to step it up in that area so that we were going to give her the opportunity to do that as well um, since she said she was that was her expertise so that was the other area that we thought that she could shine possibly Mr. Fitzgerald, pardon me. I have a, a question, maybe Janice can answer this. Is the Wee Ridge Leadership Committee uh, local businessmen? The 38th Avenue Leadership Committee is supposed to be 38th Avenue business um, owners um, on the corridor. It originally, when it very originally started, um, a lot of, it, it was basically anyone who was interested in being on it. Um, however, in the last year, we had one meeting, and four of us showed up, and I was one of them. I think the reason uh, they were asking for more money was to re-engage and try to get, get more um, yeah. efforts going. I would, uh, I would object to reducing that on the grounds that if it's not used, it can be returned, but uh, it's important to me, I think, to have buy-in from business on, on 38th Avenue. You need to get people, you need to get the businesses involved in caring about 38th Avenue. And so for that reason, I consider that to be money well spent and I object to, uh, to uh, reducing that. So I would like to amend your consensus to remove that from so I would just like to note that they estimated the $12,000 and that's all that they've spent um, 27, 20, or that's all they were given in 2016, 2017, 
and all they spent in 2018 with the lack of um, engagement and direction of the committee itself. Um, I don't feel as if it would be necessary to award them $18,000. Um, I would I would be okay with 12,000, but since the engagement isn't there, I think that that's a really important piece for anything to get off the ground. I think $10,000 is amenable. Is it worth it in your mind to increase engagement from businessmen on 38th? Why does it take money? In places throughout the city other than 38th Avenue? Yes. No, on 38th. Well, I, I would say that we would do our city as a whole um, more of a benefit to spread that out. And if we're talking about a leadership committee that's dedicated to corridors other than 38th Avenue, then yes. Mr. Matthews. Um, along those same lines, Patrick, perhaps you can refresh me. Their uh, HEAL program from Kaiser or whatever, wasn't that in the neighborhood? Uh, do you recall how many dollars that was? I'm recalling 250000 but that sounds... Yeah, the like grant they got, uh, it was a three-year three -year grant, I believe. It was for 250000 I, I believe. Okay, to do. and then my question therein is, do we know how they've been spending that money and why are they coming back to us again for another 30000 on top of that? But they presented that to us as a deal they could do without any additional cost to the city when they first got it. Well, the, my understanding, I believe, if I remember, there was a, there was a match required and the larger, larger match that they... Um, proposed for the grant, um, the better chances of getting the grant. So then they, they got a second grant also, and it required a match too, and I think, I think that's the match to the grant. They How have they been spending their $250,000 or parts thereof that they've been getting? That, um, I mean, it's a volunteer organization, so where's the money going? Yeah, it's, they're doing planning work on 30th Avenue. I can't tell exactly where the, the money has gone, but um, they did those pop-up events on 30th Avenue to um, aware, raise awareness to um, pedestrian mobility issues on 30th yeah, Avenue. I understand that, um, but how do you spend, you had volunteers come out to do that work. How, where are they spending the $250,000? Well, the local work staff is getting paid to, to, to manage that grant. So um, So they added staff for that, right? No, they didn't. I don't think they've added staff. They're paying their current local their staff. I remember at, specifically there was a young lady when I went to that meeting that came out and they said, this lady's going to, here's our new lady and she's going to do this grant program. I, I can't answer that question for you. I don't know. And I'm trying to figure out what one lady's going to do for three years to do some pop-ups at Parfit and 38th. Uh, Mr. Ann? Just to clarify, it's not as if the city writes a check to Local Works for $550,000, correct? No, they, no, they, they send they... in reimbursables um, every month to, to be paid, um, and we require um, invoices for that. All right, thank you. Uh, so I, would, I would just like to bring it back to my consensus of reducing the budget um, by 85500 and bringing the total um, to $465,000. Two, three, four. Um, we don't have consensus on that. So we could be looking for some some different um, Denise, do you have a different different possibilities to uh, see if we can get closer together um, make a deal so some of the some of the places where I think some money could be trimmed off would definitely be in like the building up business um, loan and um, a little bit off of the marketing and positioning tours because um, there are tours that aren't happening um, and then a little bit off of the communication engagement community engagement and communications. It was a $20,000 more ask. We could meet them halfway on that. Mm -hmm. and the Ridge at 38 events was another $20,000 increase ask. And we can meet them halfway on that. And then um, give them the original 12,000 for the Ridge at 38 leadership committee, which would take $60,000 off of their total budget, which would put them still at 490, which is over what they spent last year at 469. 
Ms. Dozman? So I feel like the reason we hired this new executive director is because of her expertise in fundraising, and she even touted that when she came in to give her presentation. Um, when we kind of had our side discussion, we, we noted that there's a whole lot of money going into communication, community engagement, outreach, marketing materials, digital media, and we kind of trimmed that down. So they did ask for $50,000 for the community engagement and communications, but they have only spent 30,000 in 2018, and they are asking for 38th Avenue marketing materials to the tune of $30,000 and a digital media support for $10,000. And I think that we really should be encouraging them to use digital media as opposed to the paper uh, flyers. You know, we are trying to go green, it sounds like. So um, I definitely think that taking and and i mean i discussed this issue at the last study session about how i feel like we are growing these events beyond the capacity of our resources um and the reason why these events are growing is because we market it to communities outside of wheat ridge and we draw more residents from outside wheat ridge which than, than we do from within and i agree that that's good to a point but when you have citizens or people that are coming in and coming to these free events, but maybe not staying and spending the money because they go back to their hometowns um, closer to home. It, it just doesn't make sense to me to have that kind of um, money going to specifically to outreach. Um, so if you want to make a consensus like somewhere in the middle. So, um, you know, like I said, some of these places have, like I said, a $30,000 increase on the ask. And so, and the 20,000, which we could go with 10, 20, go with, meet them in the middle with 10. So total, it's $60,000. So I would then make a consensus for us to fund them at uh, $4,000. $490,500, which is a $60,000 less than their original ask, and that would be the lowest I would, the most I would take from them. Specific line items or just lump sum? Lump, lump, sum. lump sum. They can figure out where they need to spend the money. So the, um, so the uh, proposal on the table is consensus at 490500 as an aggregate. Did I get the number right? Okay, is there a discussion uh, on that? Uh, I mean, I, I would support that as a, as a starting point, but I really would like to see um, what this new executive director is capable of. Um, she sounds very confident in uh, her abilities to fundraise and become more self-sustaining, and I've heard the board throw around ideas, and so um, I, I will support this consensus in, in the respect that uh, I really hope to see them fundraise uh, beyond this point for next year and maybe have these asks come down a little bit. Is there a discussion on the consensus, Ms. Davis? I, I'll, I'll support as well, but I, I also have the same challenge, and I also challenge a little <coughs> bit the money that has been sent on, spent on that gala um, because I've planned many galas in my lifetime, and I know if 10000 has been spent, I know what it's been spent on. And if we as a city don't know what it's been spent on, I, I struggle with that. It's either a down payment for the museum because we're having it there or something. So um, I do think we need more information on that um, because I struggle uh, with the planning of a gala is costing $10,000 because I'll do it for free and I throw a good party. Miss <laughs> uh, um, Durant, uh, Miss Davis, I uh, know, Miss Durant. Uh, Durant will work. Um, I was gonna. <laughs> I, I, I was. I was right the first time. You, know? you were. You were. I was gonna say. I support this consensus. I think we need to give the new director some time um, to get her feet in. She, Krista's great. I worked with her at Jefferson Center for Mental Health when I was on the board there. So let's give her an opportunity to prove herself. And um, we have to also remember that we do have a population in Wheat Ridge that isn't digital, and they rely <clears throat> on what they get in the mail. So we can't x them out of the picture either. So. I do support this consensus. Ms. Davis? Oh, are, uh, uh, I, which consensus are we supporting right now? All right, right now we have a consensus on the table for an aggregate amount for local works at $490,500. No. Uh, 
the 465,000. Or no, I'm sorry, yeah, no, you're right, 495,000. 490, Do we have consensus on that? One, two, keep them up. Okay, there looks like we have consensus on that. Okay. Okay, so we've had, uh, let's see, we got some money, some additional money for the Carnation Festival, uh, Wheat Ridge Business District on the, uh, on the uh, loan programs uh, and building up business. We have 25.5 uh, on the sustainability and we've, uh, we've worked on the uh, local works budget. What else uh, would we like? Ms. Hoppy. I'm just gonna go for it. Go for it. I'm just, I'm really hoping it'll go, but I would like to make a consensus to hire a sustainability and heal coordinator this year at a part-time um, with the uh, money that we've trimmed from uh, local works and the um, additional monies we have in bringing us down to 17%, I think we can afford it. And so I would like to ask for a consensus for that position. Um, so it's a, the, the position that they were proposing to happen in two, two, 2020 of the sustainability heel coordinator, which is a half time FTE. I would like that to happen this year or next year in 2019 rather than wait until 2020. Mr. Fitzgerald. Would you accept that as a consultant with a non-permanent job? I think that our purpose is to have a permanent full-time person down the road, so I think that we should get them in and get their feet wet and get them running and, and as part of our community so that we can eventually hire them as full-time down the road. Mr. Ann. I agree. I mean, if we're going to make the commitment, let's make the commitment, and if they're going to invest their time, um, we need to let them know that we're supporting them and we're behind them. Uh, Mr. Urban? I guess, you know, some of the basic questions would be who does this person report to? Uh, what type of roles and responsibilities and outcomes does that person have? Uh, it, it seems rather um, monumental just to. Uh, suggests that we have a new position and uh, without any of the legwork or um, background as it relates to who this person, not, not the individual, but what does this role accomplish for the city? And that's what I'm concerned about is while we've already uh, at dedicated a $25,000 amount uh, to the Wheat Ridge Environmental Sustainability Committee, I would like to see outcomes and uh, goals achieved under that committee, then that would allow us to figure out what roles and responsibilities a sustainability coordinator would have in six months or 12 months. But to suggest that we're going to give the Wheat Ridge Environmental Sustainability Committee 25 grand and then also suggest a brand new position without any legwork relative to where and how and what, it just, it seems uh, a bit premature. So I, I would encourage us to stick with uh, what we've already committed to the Wheat Ridge Environmental Sustainability Committee, allow that work to be accomplished show the fruits of our labor, and then employ someone down the road uh, to, to be involved in, in those activities moving forward. But to suggest that at this time, I, I think is a bit um, premature. Ms. Dozman, you have your pen in the air. Thank you. Um, so I would agree with those thoughts, and um, my suggestion was going to be that because the Sustainability Committee um, they pinpointed one of their biggest priorities as hiring a, a sustainability coordinator that we either reallocate that $25,500 to that position or we give that to the sustainability committee. Ms. Duran? You know, most of these citizens that are on, the, on this committee have families and they work. And we need somebody who can lead that committee, somebody who can implement what we're trying to do. And if it's part time and if there's criteria, you know, whatever we want to look for in this person, we can lay that out. But we need somebody who can have follow through and to ask our citizens who are already giving so much of their time to implement this is asking a lot. And this was a discussion when we first implemented this committee. There was conversation of having a director, or somebody who could facilitate this. So um, I would agree that we need to have somebody who can implement this and somebody part-time permanent. Ms. Hoppy. I would assume as all positions in the city before they hire them that they have a job description in, put together and that it's also, it's under the Parks and Rec Department. So we know that that would be 
um, who they would answer to, and um, and we're saying that we'll allocate the money in the budget for a half time, then I would assume their hours would be half time. Um, all of these are things that happen through kind of the department head and the HR before they hire somebody. So saying that I would like to hire someone doesn't mean that tomorrow we're gonna go grab somebody off the street and start throwing money at them. Um, our city's very professional in that kind of way. And so I would like to have the marker in our budget. Again, this is a placeholder so that when they are a when they're able to get it together and they can hire that person, it can happen. Mr. Matthews? I'm just concerned we start adding placeholder after placeholder after placeholder. I, I mean, I think it's our responsibility not just to hang all this stuff out here and then try and figure out, well, is it really going to be in the budget or is it not? Um, we went through the discussion earlier tonight, and that's fine. We, we're, we're changing our minds here. But if we're going to hire someone to do that, then what do we need the committee for? Ms. Davis? I just think, um, you know, I'm going with the FTEs that the staff recommended. Um, people already know how I feel about the FTEs. I think if the staff felt that the position was where we needed to be, um, I think they would have put it in um, for this year. So um, I'm going off of that. I, you know, I think that we have to go with that. And I, I mean, I would, I would just echo some of those thoughts. And uh, if we are going to hire someone to direct this board, then we hire somebody part time and it goes back to a volunteer board that volunteers their time and doesn't have a, an operating budget as a committee as well as hiring somebody. Mr. Fitzgerald? I think Mr. Matthews has a good point. Um, somehow we ought to know what the relationship is between the, the employee and the committee. Um, so I, I don't know exactly who's going to do that or when, but I think we ought to define that before we uh, before we hire somebody. What, what is their relationship? How do they work together? Mr. Pond, <clears throat> I hope we can answer all those questions because they're the right questions and they should be answered. So that that's fine. That I will vote for this consensus largely because we've talked about this for longer than I think many people realize and have c committed as a group actually previously. Maybe not exactly this group. Um, to this exactly, not not kind of like this, but to this exactly. So, um, you know, all I'm doing, in, in, you know, is is kind of staying staying to where I've been and where we've been uh, along several, you know, a few years at least. Um, uh, and 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 I will vote for that. I don't dismiss any of these questions because they're all the right questions. I mean, we we have to we have to understand the relationship to the committee. We have to understand the relationship to the budget when it comes on board, what the job description is, and how all that works. Um, uh, I hope we could get that through. If 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 we can't, we can't. But um, I'm hopeful that we can answer all those questions um, um, and and move forward. So I'll vote for it. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to go along these lines, I think uh, Councilmember Fitzgerald mentioned it earlier with uh, the term orphan in respect to this committee, and, and that term fix, fits in certain ways because uh, under Mayor Joyce J, this was an ad hoc committee, and uh, the work was done, and we appreciate all the work they were doing, but until this evening when you mentioned that in 2019 you will take steps to authorize this committee, uh, this committee has been operating in a very informal way to this point, so it has not been ratified by the City Council and there's been no formal steps taken to define the, the roles and responsibilities and the actual structure of it. And so I would ask us to withhold the discussion of an environmental sustainability coordinator until we have the proper framework in place for this committee to operate to function. We have that for every other board and commission that we have. and who they report to, but in this instance, we've already given $25,000 to an ad hoc committee, and I just, I'd ask us to take a step back and look at how to set this up formally so that it's done in the best way possible and gets us the biggest bang for our buck. Ms. Hobby. Um, I'd like to continue with my consensus and ask for a show of hands. There is not consensus. 
Okay, additional discussion on the budget. Mr. Matthews. I'll ask uh, Mr. Goff my um, annual question. Could you please reiterate for us any unfunded liabilities that we might have in the coming one to two years? <coughs> Are we still, at, do we have, a st as a, for instance, do we still have a shortfall on our Wadsworth project? We do at this point. Um, we don't have final budget numbers, but through the Valley Engineering and, and um, design process, we hope to get a, a final budget number. We're estimating about 45 million, so that leaves us potentially 5 million short. Um, we have a plan to um, apply for more Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog tip funding in in this next cycle, which would cover that. There's obviously no guarantee we'd get that, but um, and um, so yes. Anything out on how about on the other any of the other major projects we've got going, be it out at the crossing or up at uh, the railroad station, whatever. Are there any? Potential gotchas. No, I, I mean, there's always. There's always well, that's my point. There's always more cost to everything, Larry. As you know, um, you know. Fortunately, at those projects, we have money to spend um, through the the two E funds. Um, could we use more money? Yes, for those projects. Mr. Urban, I think along the same lines uh, of what Councilmember Matthews said, and I first of all want to say that the presentation you gave uh, tonight was great, Patrick. And I guess one of the things that I saw was. We, you did a great job in uh, describing all the potential uh, future revenue sources that we might uh, run into down the road. But uh, like Mr. Matthews said, that some of those unfunded liabilities are those risks that we just don't, that are, un, un, I guess, that, that in some respects they're unknown, but at least elucidating some of the possible pitfalls that we see. Obviously, you couldn't foresee a Walmart pulling out, and, yep. and that's you know something that is difficult to predict, but at least providing some sort of uh, forecasting of where things might go wrong. I know that's asking a lot, but I think it would help balance it out to say these are where we're going to see potential uh, windfalls, and this is where we see potential pitfalls, and um, that's something for next year I'd like to see um, an understanding of where might we fall short. And sure. it's no, not it's fun good. to discuss, but I think. No, and it's a good, good point. And on, honestly, I had more in last year's budget message because I thought last year we had more pitfalls and I took those out because I think that we are getting much better. Um, that's why I've always um, supported a, a healthy reserve <laughs> because you never know when Walmart's going to close. Um, and, you know, actually our reserve policy is that we target 25 percent. Um, 17 percent is the minimum. So. Um, I'm, I'll always support, and that's that's um, uh, best practice that's recommended by national um, governmental finance organizations. And I know Mr. Um, Fitzgerald doesn't agree with me, but um, I think having a healthy reserve is, is helps with those risks, unknown risks. Thank you, Ms. Dozman. So I was just, um, I meant to ask this earlier when we were talking about staffing, but uh, I was looking at some of the personnel services um, and the increases from this last year to next year. Uh, so we have the personnel services um, under the administrative, so you'll look to page 74. Um, we have an increase of $165,741 um, with only one increase of staffing, staff members it looks like. So I was just wondering if maybe you could speak to those um, personnel services, like what, what is included within those costs, as well as um, the $101,420 increase for the city manager personnel. Um, the city manager personnel, as you asked earlier, was for um, we moved the assistant to the city manager position from admin services over to um, my budget, city manager's budget. Um, I'm making a few organizational changes with Heather and Carly um, leaving the new position, which we have hired a position, Mary Ann. She'll be starting October 2nd. Um, she'll be working directly for me and, and she'll be in under my budget. Okay. Um, the HR's budget, um, there was a little bit increase. We, we um, had transition in the HR manager. Um, again, with the compet competitive um, market, we did have to um, um, provide a little bit more um, salary um, to get the person that we wanted. And, um, and then there is um, an increase. Um, no, there's no increase in HR, right, this next year. Let me see if I can figure out what's. Are you on this one? No, she had, no she's on page 74. I think she's talking about. Four and four for HR, if that he's helps. He's talking about HR, HR administrative services altogether. 
Seventy-four. What page were you on? Seventy-four. Seventy. Seventy-four. So I was looking at the personnel services. Oh, total for admin services to, propo to propose, and then I see a jump from twenty-two authorized employees in twenty eighteen to twenty-three in twenty nineteen. Yeah. So again, part part of that is um, the increase in staffing. Part of it um, is um, the uh, performance management um, budget that um, we, we last year we started budgeting that in in each department now we again we budgeted four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for um, potential um, performance management increases for employees and we used to budget that in a central budget and then um, this is the first year that we've we moved it into there so there's an additional three percent um, on top of their current budget for any potential raises that employees might achieve so is that just in the administrative department or is that in each department that's in the administrative um, services line item and then and then the money is is divvied up um, throughout throughout the, the rest of the budgets miss davis i'd like to um make a consensus to approve the proposed 2019 budget um, with the revisions that we've made, um, and it does sound, uh-oh, sounds like Ms. Dozman has a couple other questions. Um, I just remembered Ms. Holtine's ask for, I, I don't recall the amount, but the Activate 38 program. I don't know, did she give a number? I don't remember. No, I've, I, I've talked to her a little bit, um, but, but um, I would encourage us to try to reach out and try to get a specific a specific number. I don't believe that it's that's a huge amount, but it's to try to take some of the some of the proposals that have already uh, come up. And she mentioned striping. She mentioned um, speed, speed boards, speed bo striping, speed boards, striping. I've got the notes and here. One second. I have it on my notes too. One more item. Uh, let's see. Speed checker signs, refresh crossings, and alternative investing in alternative some alternative routes that are that are yeah. uh, perpendicular to Back the routes. to the corridor. So uh, Scott, um, if you remember, the speed boards are about twenty five for a pair, twenty five thousand. Is that that much? So they're they're under twenty five thousand, I think, for a pair of speed boards for one from each direction. Striping is is we could probably cover under the hundred thousand that we have in CIP budget. Uh, and I, I mean, I would hate to throw out an arbitrary number right now. Um, you know, if we can get if we, we can, can bring it back during when if, if you can if October we're com if we're comfortable you know targeting something like fifty, I would like to do that. But otherwise, let's get let's get something back from her. Ms. Dozman. I would also like to make a consensus to either decrease the amount um, allocated to the green or um, remove it from the 2019 budget until we further talks with the district and understand what either the IGA or that kind of agreement would look like. Sorry. What? What? Okay. My apologies. What? Yeah, but my my consensus would affect her consensus. <laughs> so I, I would just like to get gain consensus on either decreasing the amount of the green improvements or holding off on including that in the budget until after we speak to the district. Just, just so council understands, we do we have hired a, a design team to um, design a project. Doesn't mean you can't reduce the funds, but um, yeah, okay. Ms. Hoppy? Again, I, we wouldn't spend that money until we had a plan in place, so I'll be voting no on this, or not voting for this consensus. Consensus fails. Ms. Davis? All right, I would like to um, get a consensus on approving the 2019 proposed bu budget with already the approved um, <coughs> revisions, and it does sound like we'll have to take um, less from the reserves because we have um, saved some money with um, from the um, local works uh, budget, and um, also including um, an amount. Should I say not to exceed a certain amount for? Miss Holtings ask, or should I just say? 
Okay, so so also with uh, a consideration to um, a dollar amount based <coughs> off of Ms. Holtine's request um, on the dais tonight. You just want us to come up with a number? Because we'll need to have put something in the budget for you to adopt. Um, not to exceed $40,000. All right, let's see a show of hands. Well, I, was, I wasn't paying attention, so. Okay, the consensus. Uh, Is that a yes? That's, that's a yes. The consensus um, gets us to the next order of business. Thank you all very much. Uh, stimulating discussion. Yeah, thanks. So we will move to uh, item number three on our agenda, uh, staff reports. Um, quickly, just real quickly, you'll be interested in this, I believe. Um, I, I received a text um, this weekend from Denver Transit Partners, and they made it through their 21-day testing period. This is kind of cryptic information. Raw data shows SPD, I don't know what that means. Target was met today. This subject is to confirmation on Monday, and I got another text, it was confirmed today. So, and I asked what the next steps are. I believe the next steps are our FRA and Colorado PUC approval. So hopefully that's not a very long process, but hopefully I'll have more information. But sounds like they made it through that 21 day testing period. Soft, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, any other staff reports? Staff is, uh, staff, is <laughs> staff, is, staff is moving the other way. What do they know that we don't? Um, <laughs> All right, we have then, uh, we'll go to elected officials reports. Who, um, who would like to give a, a long report? Anybody came with, a, with a, a presentation? Okay, I believe we have no more business to conduct. Or Ms. Dozman. Yeah, uh, I just wanna give a huge shout out to Wheat Ridge High School for putting on the Farmers 5000. Uh, Christy Davis and I uh, ran uh, more like jogs. I, I, did, I got fifth in my division, which I was really surprised about. So this was my first 5K, but it is only thanks to Christy and her sister, Nikki, pushing me for my first 5K. So I just wanted to uh, thank the community for coming out and supporting that event. Um, it was their 38th annual. Uh, it was pretty hot this year, um, but uh, I look forward to seeing all of you next year, either as a volunteer or as a run walker. Okay? Do, yeah. do the rules allow you to be pushed? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to talk to the judges on that. All right, we will uh, stand adjourned. Mr. Thank Mayor, you. Mr. Mayor. All right, Janelle, you have something? Got to speak up. Um, I, no, it's short. I just wanted to encourage all of the council people and anybody that is listening on television, please RSVP for the boards and commissions dinner so that we can get numbers. It, please. Do it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pond. One more thing, and I'm, and I'm sorry because we did get this message from, from the clerk uh, on Nancy Snow's passing. Um, and and, um, and uh, I know that the arrangements for whatever is going to happen have not come out yet, but obviously, Nancy served on this body more, yeah. than, more than once, planning Very commission much. and uh, election commission as a standing member. So, uh, anyway, um, just that notice, and I think we'll have more information coming out. Um, as it moves forward. Yeah, Michael, our son, called this morning, and yeah, the, um, they're looking for a couple weeks out still for right. services. Thank you. We will stand adjourned. Thank you.